Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Primary and Secondary Modcast, Podcast, whatever the hell, hell we call it. I don't know. Today is Thursday, August 9th, 2018. Uh, the episode, 159 Degrees of Concealment. So we had this really good episode back in December, basically where we took all these concepts and it was basically like a Mythbuster episode. I want to do that tonight. I want to do that with, with the main theme being about concealment. Have an awesome panel tonight for this discussion. Um, we're going to be discussing holsters, methods, positioning, um, support equipment, designs. Ultimately, what I want to be able to do is help resolve a lot of concerns people have with various methods of positioning of, of concealment. Um, and also maybe clarify and, and, and solidify some of these concepts for people that they understand better. And I have a daughter yelling in the background. So let's see here. Uh, big thanks to Facts on Firearms. They're basically our sponsor for this for this podcast. If you're looking for firearm parts, if you're looking for AR-15 parts, if you're looking for barrels for pistols or rifles, specifically AR-15 barrels, factsonfirearms.com is a good place to start. All kinds of stuff. If you're looking for some pistol barrels that, oh, let's see here, like a rainbow type finish, maybe threaded, they also have those as well. Also, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, if you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can check out a means to help support the network. Essentially, what that does is it helps pay the bills. Primary and secondary has a lot of facets to it. There are a lot of cogs in this big machine. Everything from website, forum, lots of... Uh, uh, well, there's a lot of social media, but there's also a lot of... Uh, video and audio stuff. There are a lot of subscriptions and software to keep this moving. Not only that, it takes a quite a bit of time to, to keep going. And that time is, uh, it's precious. And especially now that I kind of have a, a, a real job that takes up a lot of time. Um, every little bit counts. So let's see here. My background's in law enforcement. I've uh, been doing the cop thing for the past 20 years. Uh, went, jumped back into full-time about a month ago-ish. It's been good. Um, it's especially been good to be able to use the influence I have and what I've learned with primary and secondary, and I get to I get to apply that to the departments that are immediately around me. So basically, if I have the, some really cool, if I have some cool connections to, to get some training or something like that, I can use that and help out my department. And I'm really excited to have that that capability. So I guess we can continue on with some intros. Let's see here. Let's let's talk to that John guy. I'm the only John here. All right. I, just, I, I think you are. For uh, now. I'm, I'm I'm John Houtman. I run uh, Filster Holsters, where we make uh, concealment equipment for uh, pistols, uh, support equipment, medical, and uh, <clears throat> we're working Innovation. on. Yeah. Well, we're at least. Trying to be a, a, a little bit innovative. Occasionally, when we can make that happen. Oh, and a topic I want to discuss also during this episode is your relation with uh, Henry Holsters. Oh, yeah. Oh, hopefully, sure. I won't forget. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll then, we, then we have Les, who's wearing a Cubs hat. Yeah, we'll wait for the mute button. Um, yeah, so originally I'm from Chicago. I moved down to Florida about uh, about a month ago. I'm actually down in Florida now, and um, it's been pretty cool. Um, it was part of Alpha Range, which is up in McHenry, Illinois, which is just a really neat um, kind of club. We've had a lot of people come through and do instruction there. We've had a lot of people come through and uh, and shoot at our matches with uh, McHenry Ipsic. I'm a USPSA GM. Uh, kind of got maybe bored with it or kind of burned out with it after nationals last year. Um, I've been like kind of hovering in the top twenties for, for a couple of times that I've done nationals. Um, one couple sectionals and that, that sort of thing. It's, it's been cool. I love shooting. Um, I kind of uh, was challenged by my friend, Mickey Shook, who runs carrytrainer.com to, to kind of put my money where my mouth is and, and actually shoot from concealment. So for the past, probably about a little over a year I've been doing exclusively that. So I've been shooting limited minor from concealment. Um, it's been really interesting going from a 
gamer guy aspect to person who's really interested in self-defense, a uh, person who's really interested in, in just caring every day, how to do that. And um, it's kind of that Gabe White mindset, right? Where get out there and the same thing that you compete with is the same thing that you carry on the street. And it's been, it really has been fascinating. Um, other than that, been doing a little bit of, of jujitsu with Paul Sharp before I moved. I've got another gym lined up down here. It's a little bit different. Paul Sharp, of course, being part of the ShivWorks group. He runs the uh, ShivWorks group up in Illinois. And uh, it was really, really interesting to take all the experience from competitive shooting and from jujitsu and, and learn really um, how to do all that and how to proof that. So it's, it's been interesting. I, I think I've got a little bit of a different take than, than most of the people here, uh, just because it's primarily competitive based. And just as like an everyday dude who carries on the street, not, uh, uh, you know, everybody has a impressive military stuff in the background. I have a, a, a giant poster of Terry Hatcher and Cabaret. Awesome. Uh, so a little, little bit different, but uh, yeah, me. No, no, it sounds like you're perfect for the panel. And if, if, if you weren't, you wouldn't be. So <laughs> thanks. Especially what you would you mention, and I thought this was especially important, um, the the competition aspect of how you're you're competing from concealment. That's that's pretty cool. I've been I've been doing that pretty much to the exclusion of everything else, and it's been interesting relearning a, a lot. Um, you know, there there's definitely more compressed timelines as far as USPSA goes in in making the draw or making the reloads. If you look at the classifier system, it's definitely, it is really weighted against you, especially now they've kind of updated a lot of the classifiers. Things are 8% harder roughly across the board. Um, you know, some of the really impossible classifiers have gotten normal or, or possible, but um, uh, it, it's interesting shooting minor. So people who are uh, kind of updated a lot of the classifiers are really, um, uh, Echo, but pe people who aren't shooting USPSA, you're penalized for shooting a nine millimeter and limited, and uh, you're definitely penalized just as far as like the the curves of the classifiers go for for shooting from concealment. So it's been it's been an eye opener. Um, I'm kind of cracking the nut on that though. Uh, we'll see. So enjoying it down here in Florida, I'll be able to train outdoors year round, which is just that'll be awesome. So yeah, good stuff. And speaking of Florida, we have Varg. We're just doing intros. So, Varg, you're up. Speaking of Florida. <laughs> hey, so uh, Varg Freeborn, uh, run uh, One Life Defense, my training company, and um, I've worked around the industry in a couple of companies and obviously have a background specific to criminal violence and close fighting with weapons. So that's pretty much what I focus on, uh, that and mostly the mindset work. Uh, so recently moved to Florida this year and enjoying it, uh, getting bit by poisonous spiders and all kinds of shit like that. So it's been a blast. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, glad to be on with you guys. When will your book be on audio or in audio form? I, you know, like I have been working on this thing nonstop and, uh, it's, um, it's definitely uh it it's coming soon it was done and then i went back and listened to the first few chapters i recorded first and i'd gotten so good at it by the end that i was like fuck now i gotta go back and read oh, that's it. cool so yeah. it's all gonna be better but um so i'm kind of pro now like that's yeah. what i that's what i call it and so it's cool because like the quality is really good by the time i got to 30 chapters so I'm going back and doing the first 10 over again. And when, as soon as those are done, I think I have like eight more to go. Uh, the book will be done. It's, it's ready to go. Oh, very good. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm going to be buying multiple copies for multiple friends. Um, I'm also really excited about your, um, your narration for the Harry Potter series. That's going to be especially good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So let's see here. Let's, let's pester Mike now. By the only mic, because last time there was like five mics. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Mike Green. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Mike Green. Uh, I have a training company. Uh, 
green dash ops. I spent uh, 15 years in uh, Army Special Forces. I got out, I started contracting overseas, did some security work, uh, got into the intelligence community over there for a little while. Um, and then now I work full time for the government and I run my uh, side business on the side, it's on the side. That cool. is all. And extensive experience with with concealment all over the globe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've traveled, you know, I mean, people forget one of the things about, um, I think if you read a definition of, uh, or someone once told me, you know, the intelligence community is basically you get paid to violate other, other countries' laws. That's pretty unique. And lastly, we do have two mats here, but I'm, there's only one I'm going to address. I don't talk to myself in third person. We have Matt, who I posted something on the primary and secondary LLC page about uh, what training people are doing, and he he pointed out, well, no one's no one's listing anything about fighting from concealment, and that happens to be kind of the discussion that we're we're talking about. And Matt happens to kind of teach that too. Matt, take it away. Um, Matt Jaques. Um former Marine back when there was nothing going on uh, for the Marine Corps to do, but, but run around in the woods with, with broomsticks. Um, was an MP, uh, started the, the concealment gig back there when I was with HMX um, with uh, President Bush 41 and then uh, President Clinton working for Marine One. And then uh, cop for um, quite, quite a while after that for two, two jurisdictions here in Virginia. Uh, and then uh, got retired from law enforcement. Um, after, after a young lad thought it would be a good idea to try and try and uh, permanently take me out of the game, so I was retired by the state of Virginia. So I've been out doing. I uh, did government work for a while. Um, worked for FN. No real concealment stuff going on there. Um, then I uh, went to work for the government. Worked for the State Department for the uh, Bureau of Diplomatic Security. So I uh, did a lot of DSS stuff um, when I left there, July first of twenty. 13, I think. Um, I was the chief operations for the firearms training unit. So it was um, secretaries detail, mobile security deployment teams, um, high threat, um, 21 different weapon systems, 32 different structures. So it was, uh, did, did, did that for, uh, I guess, almost nine years. And then July 1st of 13, went out on my own. Um, decided that the government gig was, uh, I, I'd had enough of the government telling me what I couldn't, couldn't do on Saturdays and Sundays. So um, had a had some opportunities, so I, I, I latched onto them. So I've been out doing Victory First since uh, 13, but July 1st is the first day. So um, that's what I'm doing. Uh, the training side of it's kind of a secondary, if not tertiary part. It's uh, product business development is what, I'm, what, what I do a lot of. And now I've stumbled into uh, the accessories market, um, kind of trip and fell face first into barrels and then slides and stuff while doing business and product development for somebody else. So, so here, there, that's me um, in a great, great big nutshell. So on the fed side, how much of that, how much of that training and how much of it was uh, involving concealed carry or maintaining a, like a gray or a, that type of a huge, huge. I mean, if you think about state department, um, special agents there in every embassy around the world, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, Secretary Condoleezza Rice, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Clinton. Um, those were, it's, you know, just as much concealment, if not more. Um, and I don't have that much, did some stuff with the Secret Service and cross-training and cross-pollination there. But I don't, you know, I don't have a full snapshot of what they do as far as in-depth. But it's, you know, everything, the, the quals, the quarterly quals, all the handgun stuff had to be from concealment. Um, the, uh, the only stuff that, that we really worked on them with overt was the mobile security deployment teams and then, uh, then the high threat, high threat post stuff. So um, it was a, a, lot of, a lot of concealment stuff. Yeah. Very cool. So, yeah, fighting from concealment is uh, definitely something. And it's, it's interesting how many people discount that, how much, how much emphasis is on the overt, overt shooting, overt basically combat. We're, we're getting ready for a zombie apocalypse when in reality, well, I'm actually just going to the store and I'm carrying a firearm concealed. What's more likely to happen? Uh, concealment training is not sexy. It's, yeah. uh, 
it, it, it's uh, it's nothing. If you're doing it right, it, it shouldn't be seen until the, the timer goes off, until the command of target is is sounded. But it's you know you don't get good Instagram pictures, you don't get good Facebook pictures because you don't have helmets and play carriers and slings and rifles, and you're not dancing around doing all that kind of stuff. So it's a uh, absolutely. Um, it's it, so I, it's it's just one of those things. It's not it's not not sexy enough, I guess. So yeah. let's that's, that's all right. Fine by me. Yeah, let, let's start right there because that's perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I run a, a couple of, you know, advanced concealed carry, covert concealed carry type courses. And, uh, man, they, they don't they don't feel they don't feel that much, you know. Um, I'll run up to, I think, max of 14 students. I'll, I'll get lucky and have maybe eight, maybe eight at the most, you know. But it's all, uh, I mean, it's a lot of shooting in that course. Now, I, I have everyone... Every rep is from concealment in that course, you know, and uh, it's a lot of rounds. But like, you know, like Matt said, it's it's not sexy. So people are asking about it. But when it comes time to do it, no one has their gear set up to be able to make those standards, you know, and that's they're, they're fooling themselves. I don't know. I, I got to throw a wrench into that. Um, you know, man, in the past, like I will say two years, there's been a real um I mean, there's been a real movement of, of people who are trying to do like the limited mining. I mean, we're, you know, in USPSA, I know you've got a background in USPSA and, you know, Jedi. Um, but uh, there's just kind of a background of people who are doing that. There's a, a big, you know, I think there's a huge current of people that jump into like ECQC and the ShivWorks curriculum. And um, I would say that, you know, guys like Panone have pretty good success filling some of their, you know, concealment and uh, concealment oriented courses as well. And, and, you know, Mike's been doing that for a while, but uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know. I, I see, if anything, I see that there's an increasing amount of interest in that too, just as I think in the general firearms or in industry, I think there's much more interest in all of it lately. So I think, uh, unfortunately, the name Panone just is not as well known. And so, and I think, I don't know if many, I'm, I'm thinking now of all the cops that I know in the area. I don't think anyone, any of them would consider a concealed carry type course or any of the firearms enthusiasts that I know would consider that, especially consider it to be a valid type of a investment. It's unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember uh, Mike Pannon was running a course out here um, at Echo Valley not long ago. And, uh, you know, I was going to go to that and it got canceled because he couldn't get enough folks into the course, you know. Um, and I was I was shocked to hear that, you know. And then, you know, I'm seeing it too. I mean, I'm running in October. I'm running, a, a, I had to change the name of the course from advanced concealed carry to advanced covert carry to get more people interested. But I've already yes, got like four people um, already signed up for that course. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Not, not to be a dick, but the thing that goes through my mind is like how many of the dudes that are going to attend because you changed the name from concealed to covert are going to be like the real, I'm just going to say the real Timmies that are like, and check out this Rambo knife that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't carry two Karambits? I carry four. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> in dark star gear <laughs> right I'm, I'm like i'm like general grievous with like six or seven karambas and shit so um, we pretty much established that kind of training is not as popular though it, it definitely should be and there are some awesome awesome instructors teaching this stuff so and also we have the aspect of the instagram popular over flash crap so what about conceal versus open carry? Where are you guys seeing any benefits of open versus concealment and vice versa? Because I'm very opinionated with this. And I've, I, the only time I'm going to open carry is if, let's see here, I'm training. I might be in the woods, but most likely I'm still going to conceal carry or I'm in uniform. Other than that, it is concealed. You know, I actually thought, I, I joined a, a forum, an open carry forum, a long time ago, and uh, I'll tell you what, man, I uh, I, I want to run a course just for open carry folks, you know, because you hear the same things all the time. Well, police officers do open carry. Yeah, police officers, uh, yeah, but they don't have a nylon holster from Walmart. They have an actual retention device. 
they are trained in retention techniques. You know, they're, they're, they're trained in defensive tactics. You know, you could just go on and on and on. Here's, and here's, these guys about, about this equate one? that to themselves. They go, oh, well, police officers open carry. And I go, yeah, are you a fucking cop? But they, you know what, though, they, they do decrease crime, just their mere presence. Oh, yeah. Um, you got a badge, John, you know. <laughs> it says open carry on it. <laughs> it's it's a deterrent, them being present. Though I, I've only met, I think, one or two open carriers that I was not able to sneak up on, and not even trying to sneak up on them, but I was able basically to walk up on them, and I could disarm them if I wanted to, because it's just right there, and they're completely oblivious to everything around them. You you say it's a deterrent. And I'm like, yeah, against unwanted pregnancy. <laughs> no, I'm I not positive. That, uh, I, yeah. There were several times where it, it, I could think of more than probably more than a handful that of um, three that I could say with definitive process that I went because they were disarmed. Um, you know, I retired from an agency that's just south of Washington D.C. It's not like it's a uh, it's not a bedroom community for um, you know, s small town, South Dakota somewhere. So it was a, uh, three that I know of, um, in 14 years where I went to and, and they had their gun taken from them. So it was a, uh, uh, w one guy had his gun taken from him, got, got pistol whipped, uh, got pistol whipped pretty good. And he's probably lucky he didn't get shot, but, uh, I guess that kid think thought he needed the bullets more than he needed. So he, he stroked this guy's gun and, and smacked him in the face a couple of times and off he went with it. So it was a, uh, and I specifically asked him, said, hey, why, why don't you conceal? He's like, well, then I got to go through the whole process of getting my getting my concealed carry permit. And we're in Virginia. I can just carry it openly. I was like, well, how'd that that's, work that's, out for you? That's yeah. a lot easier than getting your jaw wired shut. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. bottom line is. Yeah, he, he drank pudding and jello for probably six, eight weeks. Yeah, yeah. But that's harder than getting your fucking permit. Yeah. Well, bottom line is guys are going to open carry no matter what. You know, there's always going to be guys out there that do it. And so I'm of the opinion that if they're going to do it, then at least try to educate them on the proper ways to do it. You know, um, so I would say, you know, to those guys, that they should look at getting training and looking at their gear selection. And, you know, if they're going to do that, you know, I mean, obviously take like a, you know, a, an ECQC class, uh, you know, something to learn how to do. Uh, or work, you know, around the gun, if they're going to carry it open. Um, I mean, just so many things, DT classes or some type of combatives, uh, retention classes, or, you know, and get a good retention holster. But and now let's, awesome. we're not going to stop people from carrying openly, you know, just, just by having this. Yeah, and I have, I have guys that will come in the, I have guys that come into class, they'll, they'll email me or call me and say, hey, I want to take your class. It, you know, it sounds like a great class, but um, I live in whatever state that's, you know, there, there are some places where that's all you're allowed is open carry. So I'm fine with that. They, if they want to come and just want to train, I, I'll, I'll welcome them with open arms. If they want to open carry, I just did a class in, uh, in Richmond where two guys came in and they're like, Hey, we, you know, I said, how, how are you carrying? Are you carrying strong side, your appendix carry? He's like, well, I, I open carry. And, and I was like, all right, well, load your stuff up and get on three yard and let's get, let's, let's get it on. So, um, at least he was out trying to get training. He wasn't that demographic that we all think of. He's not that kind of guy that's gonna gonna sling an AK and walk into Starbucks and get everybody all fired up because he's he just wants to do it because he can. I think that's part of the biggest issue I have is uh, the open carrier that seems to think that they're ma they're making a positive difference, but they're ignoring all the negative aspects. They're ignoring the fact that well they're now the target, which in my opinion is not a bad thing. As me me being a, a concealed carrier, if they're the target, then the attention's on them. That's perfectly fine for me, but I'd rather them not do that. Two, two things. Uh, we talk about, um, well, you know, we, sh we should try and encourage these people to get some kind of education if they're making the choice to open carry. Um, have you ever run into somebody who in the course of conversation uh, states that they don't ever wear their seatbelt and that they believe they have really good reasons for not doing that? And that there's nothing you can tell them that would convince them that wearing your fucking seatbelt is the smart thing to do. Most of the time when I encounter someone who is adamant about their choice to open carry, I'm accepting out the people who don't have a choice, right? Where if that's their only way to carry, if that's their only way to carry, then, that's um, all. Yeah. Then, then I guess you're stuck with that. But if you're making the choice to do it, I find that when I encounter the people who are 
making that choice, they have, they're making that choice because they were adamant about it from the get go. And that you can, you know, lay it out for them. And I guess over some period of time, you're going to like water over a stone, erode some number of them into reconsidering. But I think a lot of them are like the people who are like totally convinced that, well, you seatbelts, they're just going to hurt you more than they help, you know, and they've got, you I know, an empty chamber. <clears throat> they've got a lot of reasons for uh, doing that. Um, I well, also, and it, it rightfully so, it's harder. Um, if they're not properly taught on how to uh, defeat a cover garment, defeat two layers of cover garments because it's inclement weather, then it's sure it's harder. But it goes back to it's not sexy and it's more difficult. And it's when you get on a line, if you've got 24 dudes in a class and I run 12 on a line and there's 12 watching to learn the mistakes and they watch the cover garment malfunctions, they watch the uh, if it's an LE class and they're allowed to wear serpents, they watch guys double clutch on a serpent. They watch things happen and progress. It's embarrassing when they have a cover garment malfunction. When they when they have to when the beeper goes off and, and the blue bastard makes that noise and they 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 get all wound up and they have a cover garment cover malfunction, then it, then that's not cool because all the other testosterone, the other eleven dudes you're shooting with, plus the twelve that are behind you, they all see that and it's and it's um, to try and separate uh, all of that um, testosterone and in, in the you know, the, the, that if you make a mistake, everybody else is going to laugh at you kind of thing. So it's, uh, you know, and I've heard that as well. Well, you know, it's, that's harder. Well, why don't you jump in and grab a class and, and, and learn how to do it right. So, right. Or practice maybe a little bit, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, yeah. the, the other thing is that the people who open carry to make a political statement, um, I believe that typically they are fairly tone deaf about their audience, right? I don't think that they're, if they're trying to make a statement to other people who carry guns, they are either uh, preaching to the choir or trying to preach to people who don't think, who, who know enough to sort of understand that maybe open carry isn't a really optimal solution for a number of reasons. And if they're not preaching to us, they're preaching to a demographic who doesn't like guns and it's like <clears throat> they don't understand that they are seen as ridiculous and confrontational as the protesters that we see on the opposite sides of issues that we feel strongly about it's like you're not changing anybody's mind over there you're the same way that we look at, you know, the, 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 the protesters who disagree with us on a number of issues as um, caricatures to some degree. Like, you don't, you don't see that you're being viewed that way. You need to be a little bit more savvy about your delivery of this agenda. And walking into a public space with a gun, like, with, with you, when you go into your, the Panera with, a, with, an, with an AK-47, people aren't going to see that the way you want them to see it. There's a, there's a whole enormous amount of priming that you need to do on the topic in order to introduce somebody to guns in that way. When you just walk in there like that, your message is completely lost. So I don't think that it's effective activism because it doesn't in any way take into account your audience and how they perceive what you're doing. Um, on either side of the issue, right? The, the people who would otherwise support you in your right to do that don't think you're doing a very good job and then therefore support your activity less. And the people who you're trying to convince on the topic of, of, of rights don't, don't receive what you're doing at all. It's like you don't convince people by yelling at them. You know, if I were to, if I had any agenda at all, you know, like, <clears throat> you know, whatever it is, if I walk into a public space with a megaphone and start yelling at people while they're eating, they are not going to like what I'm saying, no matter what it is. And yeah. I feel like that's a fairly equivalent maneuver that doesn't actually get the results that they want. So it's, it's a, it's a strategic a area. Your your example is is California. Everything you just said. I mean, they had open carry in California, 
and then they did it so much in your face that they ended up outlawing open carry. I mean, the, yeah, it's counter counterproductive. I, I want to I want to go back. I think this is pretty interesting. There's a precedent. Um, the way, I mean, so a lot of the gun laws changed, of course, in California, actually because of the way the Black Panthers decided to open carry and then open carry into the um, uh, the Sacramento. Um, I don't know the California legislature or whatnot, right? And uh, there was a pretty strong reaction. So this was, I think, in the uh, late '60s, right? Um, there was a pretty big backlash to, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to touch too much on race or whatever, but there was a backlash against armed black men coming into the state legislature, you know essentially brandishing shotguns and, and rifles in the whole nine yards. And um, interestingly enough, there was a um, uh, NPR, um, there's an NPR podcast called Radio Lab, and I, I'd have to find the, the actual episode, but they, they talk about how the NRA really changed from being a hunter's kind of good old boy club into a much more politically active club. Uh, I want to say that was in the, um, the very early 70s as well. Um, to try and fight a lot of like the gun control stuff. And part of that was also this discussion about how Black Panthers really changed the gun laws in the state of California. So it's interesting. There's a precedent that whenever you try and do open carry for a political reason, it, it kind of like historically hasn't really worked out. Um, you know, either you change the laws to really penalize that and penalize the overall cause and your ability to defend yourself. If that's, if that's what you're, you know, you're, you want your end goal to be, uh, or you just want to make a political statement to open things up to be more free. It's, it's kind of not, not really going to work. It's like, yeah, we kind of tried that. That didn't work. So, or somebody else has tried that. That didn't really work. So you, it's, it's just kind of interesting. There's, there's a, a historical maybe precedent for that. So, um, yeah, I, well, I mean, the, the issue of guns is a complicated topic that requires sophisticated messaging and open carrying into a Starbucks is a, like an all caps, monotonous, like monotone, high pitched yell, right? It's not a sophisticated piece of messaging when you do it that way. It doesn't, it doesn't do the issue justice. It doesn't communicate what you want it to communicate to the people you're trying to convince. I mean, obviously people have the right to do it. I'm not gonna come up here and try and look like I'm weak on gun rights. You have the right to do it, but if you have intentions, you need to be a little bit more analytical about what you're doing and evaluate whether or not the message you're trying to present is received the way you want it to be received by the audience you intend to inflict it on. <laughs> and if it doesn't, it doesn't. And you should do something else. Well, and if you think about it, the places that they do that, where they're going to open carry an AK or they're going to open carry whatever firearm, they do it in places where they know it's going to get the most political uprising. They're going to take it to a Starbucks. Why? Because we, the mass majority associate Starbucks with millennials and, and liberals and all that other stuff. They do it at a police station because they, they know it's their legal right to be able to do it, but they want to get the, you know, they want to put the cops on edge and they want to, they oh. want to videotape what the, what the cops do wrong. So it's all, it's not that they're care, they're going to open carry to the state fair. They're not going to open carry to, uh, Walmart and, and make a statement. They're going to make it in places where they know that that select market that's in that space at that time is going to get the most attention that they can now videotape and, and get on Facebook Live with. So it's. It, Do you remember that incident with those two dudes? Uh, I forget where it was, maybe like Wyoming or something. And they walk into a police station and they've got vests, ski masks, and rifles slung in their front. And they got so but hurt and indignant that the cops thought they were there to hurt them. And it reminded me of that Dave Chappelle sketch where it's like, uh, he's talking about if you're dressed like a cop and I walk up to you and ask you for help or directions and you go, I'm not a cop. Why would you think that? It's like uh, talking about if, if you, if it was a fairly insensitive bit about how like women aren't asking for it, but if you're dressed like a hoe, I might think a certain way when I, approach you and it's like if you're dressed like you're ready to come in and shoot the place up and then you get all upset that 
that people have a negative response to that. Like, what do you think you're doing? Like, really? Well, and it's and it's like, and it's odd. It doesn't matter if you're one. You it's odd. It's not. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's 1970 or it was 2008 or or 2018. It's in a residential setting. It is odd to see somebody walk down the street with a long gun. Um, in 1960, 1970, maybe, maybe it wasn't. But if if a cop would have stopped Adam Lanza walking down the street with an AR-15 slung on his back, maybe Sandy Hook wouldn't have happened because it's odd. It's not normal for a 16-year-old kid or however old he was to be walking down a residential neighborhood with that on there. Um, so when, when people start, well, it's, it's his right to walk down the street. Okay, well, let, if, if they would have been able to, and I'm not, whether they did or didn't stop, I don't think anybody even tried to stop him, but it's, it, it is out of place. It is, it is not for... Your your average everyday citizen would think that would be out of the norm. Um, if I saw, whether it's if I saw somebody whether it's, on my block with a rifle and they didn't have a badge, I'd probably point a gun at them, hundred percent. Right, like that would be there so and it's not correct for where that's like an incredibly bad sign where I am. Right, you know this is kind of interesting. This kind of um, ties back to um, to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier about open carry. Um, you know, it's interesting, and I think this is actually going to come up too. So it's an interesting segue for for another topic that maybe I'll I'll present, and if we want to start talking about that too. But um, you know, it really depends on where you're at, and this this has come up a lot too. And um, you know, there was this um, you know open carry in Chicago or Philadelphia. Not you know, just it's not a thing. It's not anything that that's. You know, people are, should do or, or, or are going to do or whatnot, unless you're somehow law enforcement that, that's uniformed and whatnot. But um, you go out to a place like Northern Arizona and Prescott, um, who was there about a year about a year ago now in uh, last October, and uh, went to the Walmart. Man, like I mean, there's soccer moms open carrying. There's there's cowboy looking dudes open carrying, and it's just it's a very different culture. It's a very different place, and um, uh, you know, maybe that works for them just on where they're at, but it doesn't necessarily work anywhere else. And I think, the, you know, it's this question of like, what's normal, right? Like John, you said, like somebody's carrying a rifle around Philadelphia or whatever, then you, you're just, I mean, I mean, you are going to, you're probably going to point a gun at them. Um, if it was Northern Arizona, it's like, yeah, whatever, you know, like they're going off to the range or they're, coming back from the range and they're stopping for coffee. It's just, it's, it's a very different environment. Um, the segue I did want to make though, is this kind of come came up and this always comes up when you talk about like concealment is, you know, how concealed should people be when they're, you know, talking about concealment. Um, there's something interesting that Lucas Bakken posted on Instagram um, about how, you know, if somebody sees a little bit of printing, it doesn't, people don't really care. And, Again, less less. I need to stop you right there. You're actually going exactly in the direction I want to go. Oh. Just so you know, because the next thing is is exactly that. Yeah, printing, and so yeah. you're you're right on. You know the the, the response that I, I kind of had for 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 Lucas Bach and kind of mirrored something that uh, Mickey Shook said. Give credit credit where credits due. Right? Is it really depends on where you are and who you're with and like what you know what your goal is in all this stuff. And we had a shooting in Chicago right before I moved. There was a guy, um, you know, the cop stopped him because he was printing pretty badly, I guess. Um, he had a, you know, three o'clock holster that wasn't like IWB or anything like that. He just had a, uh, a shirt kind of pulled over it, bulging, and they kind of stopped him, backed up, and then it flashed the gun. And, and well, the perform the indicated response kind of happened, and, and uh, there you go. But, um, you know, that kind of underscores a thing that, you know, there are some people who are really going to pay attention to that. And the people in a metropolitan PD or the criminals in like a big metropolitan area, they are really, really sensitive to that. Like, you know, they're working with the assumption that the other guy is armed, right? The other guy is going to be able to produce something, a weapon of some sort. And, and you know, like, you know, so it, it I don't know. It, it's interesting. I think that, that, that standard of, oh, you just got to cover it up or something is, is, uh, is kind of a, a bad thing. That, that, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Um, I think a lot of people have that. But there, there's some, 
there's some states that their their terminology for the law is hidden from common observation. Common observation, a lot of people deem that as can I see it? Um, if it's but if it's readily recognizable as a handgun, but then it's not hidden from common observation. Um, if you in Virginia, if you if I've got a handgun stuffed under seat, not me, but if you have a handgun stuffed under seat and I can see what is readily recognizable to me as the, the muzzle of a handgun or, or the, the the magazine well of a handgun, then it's then it's not concealed. It is um, so it's it I get where you're going with it, um, but it's a um, I think there's some interesting questions too regarding the law too. I mean, the the law in a lot of cases is written to a minimum standard, right? Depending on where you're at, right? Well, I mean, I mean, even concealed carry, right? Like the, most of the places where they actually require you to shoot some bullets at a target. I mean, like, I I don't know. Like, are any of those difficult? Um, it, it's a minimum standard. It's a minimum standard for understanding the law. It's a minimum standard for understanding what the implications are. And it's a minimum standard in a lot of cases for like, you know, oh, you just got to cover it up. And, and I don't think that's good enough. I think that's a starting point, but I don't think it's good enough. But, well, my, my biggest right, concern but there's, this. there's a minimum standard because they don't want, they don't want to buck the system. It's a minimum standard because it makes a certain demographic feel better. Oh, well, they went through and they shot two magazines worth. So, it, you know, that if it's just at an FBIQ target and you've got to hit it eight out of 10 times, then that, that satisfies the, well, they went through training without having to force somebody because it's their second amendment. You should be able to carry a gun. Um, it, it's a, I think it's the, it's that fine line of, we're not going to make you go spend $500 to take a, a two day class and get certified. But if you at least pick it up and show us that, you know, where to point it and how to turn it on, how to turn it off, then, then, then you get the blessing and get your. That's, that's how I see it. It's, in, a, it's a means to an end. Uh, yeah, they, they got training. In terms of like legal definitions for concealed, I think if you're going to have a concealed weapons permit or a concealed handgun license, there's obviously got to be some legal definition for what constitutes concealed. And you want to make sure that the people who are making some kind of good faith effort to conceal their gun aren't... Um, going to get wrapped up in some legal problem over whether or not it's technically concealed. So they make the criteria for whether or not it's concealed relatively clear and relatively easy to meet that standard. Now, the issue is when someone says, now that's, there's a difference between whether or not it's legally concealed in a way that's not going to get you in trouble in terms of your concealed carry permit. And then there's whether or not it's practically concealed enough to be effective, right? Whether or not you're implementing concealment as an effective strategy. And I, when, I, when I hear somebody say, well, no one's gonna notice if you're printing, that is code for I've never been around sufficiently dangerous people. Well, Amen. it's not only that, but it's not just like, just like the one you were talking about in Chicago where the guy got stopped, or I saw a blip of it, the, the guy in Philly today that got in a shootout with the cops. He got stopped because it was, uh, the, the cops had um, reasonable suspicion, probably damn near probable cause to think that he was carrying a handgun because of the, yeah. the way he was carrying it. Maybe he was, maybe he was hipping it. Um, so if, if that guy was a lawful concealed carrier and he was concealing it properly, he would have never been bothered. The cops wouldn't have been able to tell. There wouldn't have been reasonable suspicion. There wouldn't have been probable cause for any kind of stop because they deemed that there was a law being broken and the guy would have been on his way and he'd be alive today. Um, so it's there's the, the ones that, that want to put on their schmedium shirt um, because they, they, they think that they're, you know, sun's out, gun's out, whatever it is, and then they've got a Glock 21 on their hip. Um, they, in my opinion, um, Shouldn't be surprised when an officer says, hey, uh, can I talk to you for a second? Right. You, you put yourself out there. Um, if I'm driving down the road at midnight and I don't have my headlights on, high probability I've had too much to drink and I'm going to get stopped. Why? Because that's, that is an indicator for a, a law being broken and, and I should expect to get stopped. So it's um, the, in the, the concealment aspect of it should be concealed. And this is, this is how I look at it. I... Um, I subscribe to it needs to be as concealed as I possibly can because I don't know where I'm going to end up in, in, in my day-to-day -day travels. Now, I live in the D.C. region. I could be 
I could leave Fredericksburg and get a phone call and have to go to Baltimore County, Maryland, or I could have to go somewhere else uh, in, in my region. And maybe I have to go in somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm on a meeting with somewhere. We're going to walk into a restaurant that says no guns allowed. Well, I'm not going to take my stuff back out and park it in my truck. But I also don't want the manager to, when I walk in, I want, don't want the manager to go, oh, I think that guy's got a gun, so it's going to cause me issues. My gun is concealed as it absolutely deep as it possibly can be, but yet I am skilled enough to be able to get it out and get that sub-second draw on a target if, if deadly force is authorized. I don't, I don't want it out where everybody can see it. I don't want it out where any, anybody can even uh, think that it's, that it's a gun. It is deep enough that nobody will be able to. If, if somebody wants to come in and give me a bro hug, I can, I can grasp their hand, and when I bring them and give them a bro hug, I can control their hand. It goes above my gun. They're, they're not going to bump into it. Um, if, if, uh, if I run into an old friend somewhere and, and they want to give me a hug and they pat me down for some reason on the side, they're not going to know it's there. Um, there's, um, I'm not going to get into the, the, the appendix carrying the reason why I've subscribed to it for so long, but that's, um, it is deep and it, it, it is deep enough that it's, that it's not readily noticeable unless, uh, something happens that's outside the norm. Even wind is not going to show you that I've got a heater on. So that's just. But so I, see, me, I see where you're going with it, John. For yeah. me, with all of this, the, the, the largest aspect seems to be missed on the people that are saying, well, it, it's okay if, if people see that I print. And I, I'm going to call on Varg specifically because we've had this discussion. But the reason I'm carrying a firearm is not because of the general public. The reason I carry a firearm isn't because of grandma might see that there's something, I'm carrying something. No, the reason I'm carrying a firearm is because of those predators who are going to be looking for the opposite, the, the cops or the, the, I'm not going to say sheepdog because I can't stand that concept, but essentially that, that those types of people, the people that will actually intervene or that may stop criminal behavior. So when I carry a firearm and it's concealed for a reason, because of those people, I don't want them to know that I have a firearm. Varg, in your experience dealing with criminals, dealing with those types of people, how observant are they? And are they looking for, for clues of, in your gait, in your posture, in your movements, in your clothing, that someone might be, I don't want to say alpha, but you know what I mean? The, so the way, the way that I put it is that concealment is something that a lot of guys in this part of the sphere only learn about or, or hear that word for the first time when they go to the academy or they go get their uh, concealed carry license. Whereas concealment has been practiced by the criminals since a very, very early age on many different levels. Um, that's smuggling drugs, hiding things from their parents, from the schools, from cops, authorities. This is something practiced and, and you know, cultivated very early. So the ability to spot that in another person is very highly developed. Um, and the way that, that concealment for me ties into the nuances of fighting and close fighting because in in most cases the criminal is going to employ ambush and the way that i differ differentiate that is if you're involved in social violence it's not ambush but most likely you're being you're fucking up somewhere by getting yourself involved in social violence and letting it escalate um, but if you're doing your job and you're avoiding social violence the highest probability then is ambush and the well-hidden tools intentions and capabilities are very effective prerequisites to setting up a, an effective counter ambush. So the more that you put those on the table, the less advantages you're giving yourself for the counter ambush, which showing is showing your hand is, is absolutely the most important thing because the difference between selection, target selection and target analysis when you're dealing with the really dangerous guy is that instead of uh, deselecting you because you have a gun on your hip, he's going to, just analyze now how he needs to approach you and how much force he needs to use when he does go at you because you've given him a lot of information to formulate a better plan with. It's just analysis over over selection. It doesn't mean you're not going to get fucking selected because they can see your pistol. It just means that they have better information to work with for their ambush, in my opinion. That's great. That is great stuff. And, and, and you're a more valuable target. You pick up another gun and a wallet and a set of car keys. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I break down the uh, in, in my classes when it comes to concealment into three phases, typically uh, low profile concealment and covert. And each one of those typically correlate to a couple things. One being your environment. Um, what's the uh, repercussions for being caught? And then two, accessibility. So 
um, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, it was pretty much just low profile. You had um, something that would pretty much pass a visual inspection as you were scanning, you know. Uh, concealment is more along the lines of what most people in, in the U.S. would probably carry, you know, maybe a little bit of printing. But, you know, if they're stopped by a police officer, they're going to show proper identification and, you know, be good to go. Um, and then conce uh, covert basically is, hey, you know, like Matt said, you know, you're going into a, uh, a an establishment that may not want you there with a firearm or, you know, you may be in a, in a location or another country where if you're caught, it could, you know, could cause an international incident. Uh, we, we had that happen one time. We uh, took a, uh, a train and one of the guys, we got off the train um, and the police were in Latin America and they were like all around him because he was printing really bad. And, you know, he's showing documentation and they're like, we want the gun. It's like, no, I, I have everything. Um, and we still end up going down to the police station, but it was, it was real close because they, they wanted that firearm, you know, and, uh, you know, potential international incident was almost, it was diverted, you know, but eventually everything worked out, but it could have been resolved by him having a better cover shirt, um, which is another thing, you know, is when I started working in these other countries, the way I dressed, the way I trained, the way I practiced, all that changed, you know, um, it, you know, I, I changed the way I carried, um, and I started realizing that I wasn't as fast as I needed to be with that concealment. So I was basically practicing, um, you know, drills that I would use for USPSA, but from concealment, I was doing build drills, one shot drills, um, you know, El Prez's and stuff like that. And, and, you know, they're not easy to work around when you have that type of concealment. Um, and, and I was going for a convert, uh, more of a covert mode, you know, but one thing that helped me around that was the way I dressed, you know, um, obviously I had to buy bigger clothes and clothes that, uh, would, you know, break up that pattern just a little bit more in those countries, because, you know, e even though you're authorized to carry, it, you get caught in, you know, it, it could cause an international incident. And in, in the States, you know, if you're someplace else, I mean, guys get itchy trigger fingers. So if you're stopped by the wrong guy, you know, and he says, Hey, I need to see something in, instead of, uh -huh. you know, you saying, Hey, uh, you know, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up my concealed carry permit. And the guy thinks, well, wait a minute, you're going for your gun. Now what, you know, and it could have been avoided by, you know, properly concealing the firearm. You know, I think this is kind of interesting. It's um, a lot of people think about, you know, the type of holster, the design of the holster and, and all that stuff. And I think that that buys you an incredible amount, right. In terms of actually like, you know, making sure that thing isn't really visible, but I don't think enough people think about like what they wear when they get out there. Or, <laughs> you know, sure, it's, it's a system, right? You know, or or hey, he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt and a five eleven hat. It's like, oh, come on, dude. Right? <laughs> I mean, okay, if you're going to the range, it's one thing, or uh, you know, but I mean, unless you live in Florida or Hawaii. You know, like dudes in Hawaiian shirts in Chicago. It's, you know, if you're right, it's like it's like you you see people who, like, I I understand that you have sufficiently concealed the gun to the point that it's invisible, but you've done it essentially by draping yourself in a number of flags that say I have a gun. Yeah, like yeah. like you can conceal your gun really well, but if you're dressed like a dude who's carrying a gun, it's not. <laughs> Except less. What about Steve Dahl? He, I, I think he still wears. Uh, yeah. Okay. I stand corrected. Yes. 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 Thank you. You know, we had that great discussion about the loop the last time it was on. And, uh, yep. Yep. Have to bring up Chicago. Moment of silence. But uh, um, right. yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing, though. It's like you know, if you fit a certain pattern, if you're a big fat guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt in Chicago, okay, you get a pass. <laughs> you know, but. Uh, uh, but for the rest of the people, it's like, dude, that's a tell. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know. Like, well, you know, yeah, is it, a it's a lifestyle. Segment. You got to dress yeah. your lifestyle. So it's a, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I ride a Harley Davidson. So I, I have the advantage of when uh, when I go into a Harley shop, that's where when we started talking um, concealed carry shirts, when I was 
building those shirts off of Vertex. It was a lot of those were based off of Harley shirts. Mm. Uh, while Harley shirts are expensive, um, they have there's some with pearl snaps. Um, a lot of them have regular snaps. The the way they would lay the the cut on them, the the hem on the bottom wouldn't hang up on flashlight clips and, and knife clips. There was a lot of stuff that I took from um, Harley Davidson shirts, and then some of the um, not Wrangler shirts you would find in Tractor Supply, but Wrangler shirts that that are like 20x shirts, um, actual no joke, um, great shirts, pearl snaps. Um, they're a little bit longer. The way the hems cut, there's no pockets in the in in the button seam, so all of that stuff, and, and it's a lifestyle. So it's um, I can wear I can wear a Harley shirt. I can wear um, I, I'm a country hick, so I can wear plaid. I was I was plaid before plaid was cool, um, and it was you know I can get probably get away with wearing corduroys still, but it's uh, I'm I'm a I'm a cowboy boot guy. I have been since I was a kid. So a lot of that lifestyle, I find things that work for me, and that's and, and I can fit in anywhere. The only thing that changes for me is if I know that I'm going to be going somewhere. Um, when I said earlier that I, that I concealed to the depth where I'm fine being able to, like Mike said, if I put it in Mike's terms, that, that covert for me is just low pro where I could walk into somewhere where I, it would be frowned upon to have a gun. Um, but if I'm going to wear a t-shirt or a polo shirt, that is a little more, um, it, the pattern doesn't break it up. The, the material doesn't flow right. There's nothing I can do to modify to make it work better. Then I have another holster that is set so it's deeper. So I have to clear my cover garment, drive my thumb to my waist, go in and I fetch the gun out. That's not my day-to-day. -day. My day-to-day, -day, I can reach down, clear the cover garment and get a fistful of pistol grip. My master grip is good from the holster. Um, if I'm going to wear a shirt that's going to be a little bit more uh, athletic cut and I'm not as athletically cut as I used to be. So sometimes that may, that may print that. So I've got another holster that runs that gun a little bit deeper, still take a G 17, but I can conceal it on myself and, and have it. I could, I could walk into wherever that, that I'm not supposed to have a gun in, and nobody would see it. Um, if they don't have I, a magnetometer, then, then, I, then I'm in and I'm out. I love the, the vertex lines. The, uh, I, matter of fact, right now I'm wearing the Delta stretch pants love them the the shirts that you designed i think i have one in every every uh pattern they're great they fit nice they do what they're supposed to do yeah, yeah the delta well, strike and, and, yeah. appreciate like, that like appreciate and, that there's also the uh, ahead, like you were saying <sighs> lifestyle you know um you know i find you know because i carry a knife i'm sure most of us carry a knife and a flat like but I find where I, when I go to places where I am really trying to work on, you know, deep concealment or covert, um, and I'll take those, uh, that knife and that, that light and transfer it to my waist. We're saying that that's an indicator. Other yep. people see that, you know, yep. uh, a locked on guy, you know, uh, you know, a good cop or, you know, a good bad guy is going to see that knife or that light and go, Hey, this guy's probably packing too. So I, and it's, totally and I can, so here's something else, Mike, that you might want to look at. Um, if you guys are familiar with the and out, it's it's kind of a dirty secret. It's in my sock drawer. Um, the Raven Katima pocket shield. You can take a piece of 550 cord, loop that on the inside of your belt, and I can carry a G43 in a holster, um, a spare mag, and a knife, and, and lay it down inside my underwear, and it's it's completely gone. It's a there's a piece of 550. I can if I'm going to go in somewhere where I I need that. I go in, I pass through security, I go into the bathroom, reach down, grab the loop, pull it out, pocket shield comes out, I reset everything the way I need to, and I go about my business. And it's, um, it's, it's just, if they want to, if they really want to start patting things down, they're going to end up hitting an Aries gear buckle, and they'll be like, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's a hell of a belt buckle. Uh -huh, sure is. Um, and, and truth be told, most dudes don't want to look, no less touch down there. So it's a, uh, it's in and out. So you, you can tether all that stuff on, on something and, and drop it down the inside of your, um, it, it, like for me, concealment, I wear Duluth boxer briefs. So that if, as we're going to get weird like this, because they're, um, they're, they're, it, yeah, they're good support, but they're good support for that pocket shield. If I need to drop it down on the inside, all of that stuff can stay in there and it, and it, and it compresses it and holds it and, and I'm good to go. So, um, that's great stuff. It's, so, sorry, we're getting, we're getting weird now, but no, because <laughs> no, this is perfect. This is the topic. Yeah, the, the Aries gear buckle is great for like sliding a knife between your pant and your body. Uh, and if you pass through a metal detector, because it reads off and they're like, they'll wand you and they can't ever see anything. So, like, 
I'll admit I've done it a few times in concerts where I go through and I'm like, as soon as I get through, go to the bathroom, pull it out, slide it in my pants and I go on with my life. So yeah, I, I realized that when it started setting, like when I, cause I wear Aries gear relatively regularly and it sets off every metal detector. I'm like, I wonder if I could do this. And the first time you do it, it's always kind of like just a little bit nerve wracking. And then after that, it's like fucking easy day. Well, it's even better when you're in my position where they're, where it sets it off and you show them the belt buckle, but then they see the nine inch scar from where your, your lumbar spine is. You'd be like, yeah, there's a lot of metal and they're like, Oh geez, sorry. Go on. So, it's so tough. everyone should get that surgery. Okay. Right. No, 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 don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah. It's a, a lot of, uh, a lot of hotels overseas, you know, they have metal detectors or they'll have somebody wanding, you know? So that's one of the reasons we started doing appendix over there too. Um, and, uh, I remember I went in and everybody set the metal detector off and uh, I got the, I was the first guy. So I set it off while everyone's, he searched, this guy's searching me. Everyone's, it's like a, like that scene from airplane where everyone's going through beep, 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 beep. And so I was the only one turned away because they, they eventually found the firearm, you know, but everybody else got in and, uh, but you know, you start to learn those different things, you know, you watch how different places do their, uh, their screening processes, you know, um, and we'd always send somebody, try to send somebody up to one place and say, hey, just try to take a knife in there first, you know, and if you get caught, it's no big deal. Um, and then we'd you know, start to see those patterns and then, then we would try to get into that establishment. See, I, uh, nowadays, doing that in California, I, I want to see people bring straws into establishments. That's a terrible joke. Terrible joke. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all week. I was uh, really, I was really lucky. Uh, the first class I ever took was uh, fighting pistol with Matt and listening to him talk about using uh, your cover garment because he used the phrase cover garments a bitch and doing everything from dropping a few quarters and having them sewn into the corner of your shirt so that way if you superman it open it gives you enough hang time to get your gun and you know the, the weed whacker string trick I still use that from time to time that's a good one um, but yeah learning and figuring out which of those like garment modifications work for you. Cause like there's some, some jackets I wear and shirts I wear that I have to run the gun, like the actual belt and everything a little bit lower in my body because I don't get as much clearance when I raise up and being able to like take them to a seamstress and just have them let out in the, in the lower area. So you have a little bit more bell at the bottom of your garment. I've done that in the past, but I, I was very lucky early on to learn some, some dirty tricks from Matt. Jayquees, not me. Well, that's, yeah. and, and, and that's like, uh, we talk lifestyle when, when, um, you know, the, the vest is something that I still use. I, I used it a lot, um, early on, but now when I go into places, because I wear, you know, I wear sport coats and, and, and I dress up a little bit more, uh, the vest is an underrated cover garment, hundred percent. But then it also comes down to, there are some pairs of trousers that I can't wear with a vest because I ride too low and it's going to show the only thing that it shows is a single overhook. And if I run it in between, um, the, the layers of my belt, it's not seen, but I carry appendix carry with a vest with no jacket. So now I can wear a dress shirt, tie vest. Uh, I look like Dapper Dan. Um, but it's, you know, I can go in and out of places and, um, regardless, uh, we're all human beings and you are treated differently. Um, how you dress. So you go in somewhere that's a, you, you may not be going into an executive building, but if I walk in somewhere with a, a long sleeve shirt and a vest on in at a tire, negated tie, um, I will be treated differently. If I walk in there with ripped up jeans and an old Ford t-shirt and, and, uh, it, it, that's just the way it is. That's, that's human beings. Um, so it's a, the, the vest is an rated cover garment for, um, specifically weather. Uh, Vegas is hot and sticky. I don't like wearing a jacket all the time. So, uh, a vest will, will absolutely take care of that problem. People ask, uh, people ask if, you know, things like J frames are still relevant, you know, like why, why would you even buy that or carry that? And, um, we're talking about cover garments and access. And in the winter time, uh, I think that a J frame is a great choice for pocket carry in your coat. Um, it's faster to get to, uh, it buys you a little time to get a couple shots off and maybe those are the only shots you need, or maybe they give you the time to access your other gun. Um, 
in the winter time in Philadelphia, if I got to like, everything's really walkable here. I don't, I don't necessarily drive a whole lot because there's a lot in my neighborhood that I can walk to, but there's also, it's block to block. And, you know, if I can walk to somewhere nice in, you know, 10 minutes, but the 10, 20 minute walk back is through some spots that aren't so nice. And uh, in the winter time, I will definitely throw a J frame in my coat pocket, especially if I've got to like bundle up and wear a number of layers. So you can kind of overcome the issue of layers by having something smaller in one of your outer pockets, especially something like that, that isn't going to have a reciprocating slide. And uh, I can, you know, fire a shot through a pocket if I have to, especially if there's nothing else in that pocket. I don't keep keys or a phone or anything else the fuck in that pocket. So at, at yep. a, uh, are, us, you guys good with that? Because, you know, when winter comes in Florida, we'll, oh, wait, we won't be able to carry a J-frame in a coat pocket down here. You're, you're talking to a guy who wears a Patagonia puff jacket in like 60, 70 degree weather. So like, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a horrible reference point. But no, I mean... The nice thing about Florida is that carries pretty consistent all the year round. You know, the only thing you're changing is length of either sleeves or pants. Uh, most of the time I'm rocking, you know, either my Prana jeans or Vertex Delta stretches. They stay pretty consistent. They breathe well in the summer. They provide enough w warmth in the winter. It just basically, am I going to throw it over layer on? And generally, my, like this jacket specifically, it's a size bigger than I need it to because it's tighter around the waist. So when I clear garment high, I can still get shirt and access my, my pistol to bring it out. And it's just, instead of grabbing one cover garment, I'm just grabbing a handful of two when I sweep up. It's the benefit it's, of living. It's a, si it's a size too big, Adam, because you weighed 70 pounds more last month and you didn't buy a new jacket yet. That's why it's still so big, man. Hey, man, don't, don't hate, on, the player, hate the game. <laughs> Dude, uh, I, I, I hate this like losing weight and, and going from strong side o OWB being a big guy to living the joys and the ease of appendix carry. Like I used to think it was bullshit for a long, long time. And then I was like, man, I could carry a 34 with a U boat. Nobody knows in t-shirts, flip flops and shorts. And you know, as long as your system of holster belt is, is good Everything else you can cut, you know, you can drape a bigger shirt over it. You can run a little bit tighter shirt if you have a really good setup. And and nobody knows, like you there's no excuse to be undergunned, especially carrying a handgun now, because uh holsters like the Adolan, uh the Spotlight, uh Dark Star Gear, like they are they're the best out there and they allow you to do things that you didn't typically think you could do. And most people have a hard time believing that. It is far more comfortable to carry a long slide gun, a 17 or a 34, than it is carrying a 43. Like, yep. I'm sorry. It's just, it's not that fun. You have to do a lot of modifications to prevent, you know, 43s from dumping or 42s dumping over the belt line, at least in my opinion, where 34s and 17s, and Matt can speak to the science much better than I can, just carry better and they are more comfortable. The, I won't need to speak to it. There's a uh, there's an article I wrote called the Lego Principle, um, and you got you can read it if you want to. But it's if anybody that's got kids or has walked in a house and stepped on a Lego, Legos wouldn't hurt if they were that damn big. All right. So when you start talking shields, forty twos, forty three, small guns, you put that on your waistband, you start bending over. It's they, they cause those hot spots and those pinches on the muzzle end and on the the, the rear of the slide, and, and it's the Lego Principle. If the if the Lego was the size of a damn license plate, it wouldn't hurt. Um, so it's, uh, I've, I've carried a 17 exclusively for probably, I don't even know, six or seven years now from, uh, riding from Fredericksburg, Virginia, to Sturgis, South Dakota on a Harley, um, 60 to 70,000 miles a year in a truck. Uh, it, it's a, a 17 is what stays there. Um, it just doesn't make sense to carry a smaller gun. Yeah. One I, mean, of the, I was going to say one of the, one of the other issues is that, uh, with a smaller gun, like, especially with like a 26, if you imagine the belt line and you imagine the grip of the gun above the belt line and the muzzle below, there's more mass above the belt line than there is below the belt line, which means that the gun as it's being worn is going to be top heavy. So it's going to start to lean out over the belt. If, especially if, 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 if you have a holster that's exactly the same length as say a 26 and the muzzle's going to drive into your body more 
than if you say, you know, if you imagine the way a sailboat works, a sailboat doesn't completely tip over because it's got a keel below the water. So if you extend the holster a little bit further than the gun, it's going to balance it out. It's going to increase the surface area that contacts your body and reduce the Lego effect. And it's going to help keep the mass of the loaded magazine. I mean, like if you've got 12 rounds of 147 grain ammunition in your Glock 26, that weighs about twice as much as the inch of muzzle that is at or below your belt line. So it will tip out over your body. Most of us have a little bit more gut than we would want, and that's going to help press it out over the body. Um, not all of us have ripped six pack abs, so it's not going to stay perfectly flat. And uh, one thing that we made the choice to do a number of years ago was make one size of Glock double stack uh, holster. So we make the classic 17 length period. It'll take a 26, a 19, or a 17, and 34. all the and a 34, and all the smaller guns fit better and conceal better and are more comfortable in a holster that's a little bit longer. Um, when I had very first started carrying a gun a number of years ago, I bought a Gen 2 19, and it was awesome. And then I got enamored with the 34. And I started carrying that, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out why the 34 was more comfortable and more concealable than the 19. I'm like, but it's a bigger gun. This doesn't make sense. And it took a, a lot of experience to figure out what the actual principles were at work that, 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 that made that uh, case. Yeah, the only way I... The Lego able... principle. Yeah, the only way I've been able to get a 43 to even ride halfway comfortable is you have to put a wedge on it as big as the state of Texas. Like That's a big wedge. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's the only way I can keep that gun from dumping forward. And when you look at it, it's like, do I really need to go that small? Like, I think I've maybe carried my 43 once. Like, I've got a Grip Chop 17 that if I need to go really low profile, like, and I... I think that's a better solution than buying a 19 is get a 17, whack it down to a 19 length frame and you have a better shootable gun that still holds those same things where you're getting a shorter grip length. But again, with a proper belt and holster setup, I don't see the, the downside of having a, a full size 17 or 34 length frame. I just don't, I, I haven't. And that's what? why I generally don't drift away from those guns anymore. The good ones are the guys that get the nineteen, the seventeens get the the pistol grip chopped down to a nineteen, then carry seventeen mag in it. Yeah, right. that. Yeah, you look at it, it's like, come on, man! Like you were there, you were so close, like you saw the finish line, and you were like, "Fuck yep. it, I, I'm I quit, I'm done." Yeah. And like, so I need more bu- I need more bullets. But it's easier to hang onto that gun if it's got a full pistol grip on it. Yeah, like I get. I'm sure people would make fun of me, but like it's a 34 and my backup mag is a 17 mag with a Dawson plus five. Like they're, they're easy things to carry because you can sink them further below the belt line and you have, you know, it's just easier, more comfortable. Like, you know, I think maybe above belt line, I have about just like the plus five, which still accesses really quickly. And, you know, you've got 22 rounds of whatever flavored nine millimeter you, you need on deck for if, 18 the gun's not enough yeah now i was carrying a full size overseas you know uh concealed i thought that was going to be an issue and then i started dressing around it you know and then uh you know i would come home and then i would carry my 19 and i realized you know really it's not that big of a difference you know so yeah if you if you dress properly too you know that's that's really gonna gonna be the key there is make sure that you're you know your gear is set up and it's accessible uh, it just but then again you keep running the same thing over and over again with with students is they, they don't practice you know with that gear they don't practice from concealment um you know and and it's and there's a lot of guys out there so i went and taught a um i taught a um a law enforcement agency down uh there's a down in uh, down south and uh you know they're every one of them you know oh we carry concealed all the time you know 
and then we started shooting the drills and I was telling guys before we started shooting the drills, Hey, you might want to make these modifications the way you're dressed, this and that. No, no, I got it. I got it. And by lunchtime, dudes were running to Walmart to, you know, make some changes, you know, buy some extra gear, t undershirts and stuff like that, you know, um, because it was obvious they didn't train with their gear and uh, they realized that and guys started getting bigger shirts. So I worked with a, uh, an FBI office one time, and it literally looked like somebody was taking a uh, duty rig and then wearing a, a T-shirt too small over. And you're like, what the heck? The whole entire office was like that. And we're like, are you kidding me? This is. Yeah, dudes you know, walking like, around with hip cancer. Yeah, I mean, they had the radios or handcuffs, you know, I mean, everything. And you're like, what the heck? But, you know, you, you, again, that's that to me, that wasn't concealed at all. That's, you know, more of a low profile for them, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's I mean, covered. Yeah, exactly. It, it is simply, you know, um, th yeah. But well, um, yeah. Has anybody touched on that? This shit is expensive. Like f figuring it out, do, being good at it is expensive. Like you're going to go through shirts. You're going to go through holsters, and belts and guns because what works for the people on the panel may not work for you. And I there's probably some similarities in what we carry, but it's an expensive proposition. But at the end of the day is the few hundred dollars or the few thousand dollars. Does that mean anything in the grand scheme of your life? Cause that's the biggest complaint I ever see when talking with anybody about this is like, Oh, uh, you know, a hundred dollar holster is expensive going to shoot. Whatever is expensive. It's like dog nine millimeter is on the expensive side, 50, $15 for 50 rounds. You can go get good good reps in a, in a week for 50 rounds and be good and keep your skill up. And, yeah, so what if you have to burn through a couple holsters or a couple belts? You're going to eventually have that, like, aha moment and figure out what fucking works for you. But most people get scared off because of the price tags associated with all this gear. Yeah, I got some holsters. You know, yeah. I don't get rid of them. I keep them. We, we all do. Like, we <laughs> but, all uh, do. but, you know, like you said, it's expensive, but what's your life worth, you know? Well, yeah. And that's also, that's also kind of what the primary and secondary is going to help people with. We have a panel like this. We've spent a lot of money on this stuff. Please learn from our mistakes. Don't make them. You know, I'll, I'll say, I'll say this too. I think a, a lot of people get so wrapped around, you know, these questions about gear and the questions about the right holster, it'll, it'll, it'll be perfect. And, you know, man, just, just accept it. Like it's the criteria that's really the most important. Like you can structure your gear and your pistol and whatever you carry, you can make it work. It just, it takes a little bit of commitment, it takes a little bit of practice and it takes a little bit of like searching for, for stuff. I mean, like, there's two people that make like a like a concealment holster that, that's worth a shit for a Beretta. You know, pick one, right? Like it, it right now it's and I know John's here, but like and he's got some holsters hopefully in the works. We're working on it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but like it, it's coming soon. Right? Nobody cares about Berettas. Right? No, no, no one cares about Berettas except for all the people that love the uh, Ernest Langdon Berettas. I have a, I have a Langdon Beretta. There you go. That's why I bought it up, you know, a yeah. Wilson combat shirt. But, uh, um, you know, the point is, is that, you know, there, there's like JM and keepers, you know, they both make a holster. Um, hey man, you know, take a drill to it and drill some extra holes and figure that shit out. Right. I, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. You know, you're looking for something that is going to be accessible, right? There you go. You know, the, the yoga block wedge and whatnot, you know, do, you know, you're going to have to play around with some of the stuff, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you got to break the bank. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that you do have to think through. And I think, you know, between wardrobe and making it all work, like, honestly, that, that that's where you really want to spend most of your time and then getting out to the range and practicing with it and driving. Les, with it. Les you know, it's a lot of fun going to the mall, picking out clothes and going into the fitting room and trying them on with your gun on to see what fits because you know what if it if a shirt's too tight put your clothes back on walk out get the next size up and you can figure out what garments work what materials work and you can sit there in a full mirror and be like oh okay maybe the heel is printing a little bit more maybe i'll bump it up from a an xl to a 2xl on this specific shirt because i like what it is like 
it's it's not that hard. It's just applying so, normal everyday shit to it. Do you want to know a secret that I probably shouldn't tell people as a holster maker? Don't tell them. You can go buy the cheapest blade tech that exists, some double sided Velcro, and some neoprene foam, and with some enough sculpture, you can make anything smaller than a desert eagle disappear on your body. Interesting. Uh, it Six might out. it might not be the best retaining holster. You might not love the way it fits. You might not necessarily uh, love the, the the retention. You might not love the quality, but you can rig up anything to conceal if you're willing to put in the sculpture time with your yoga block or your your foam. Uh, yeah. something you could wind up with something that doesn't necessarily last very long. You can wind up with something that you're going to have to tweak and adjust a lot. And you could wind up with something that once you have it, you replace it knowing what you're looking for. But you can get started playing around with really cheap stuff. The way I got into making holsters was by taking cheap holsters and modifying them to do things that I wanted them to do. like. I didn't have money, <laughs> you know, and I didn't really even know what I wanted, but I had some number of tools and I had some aptitude for, 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 for playing with it. And I bought some blade techs and I put holes in them and I put them to the grinder and I put different hardware on them and I, you know, played with how they were shaped. And then I eventually started making them from scratch, you know, uh, there are a lot of holsters that do really good work and they're equipped with a number of features that you see the value in. If you know what you're looking for, you want to get an appendix holster and it's got a wedge feature and a claw feature, and those are going to work together to do what you want. But if you don't know what the hell those are or how those kinds of features integrate or interface with your body, you're not going to necessarily know which brand to get because each brand is going to have different shapes and different features and different combinations. And those are all going to be relatively anatomical, anatomically specific. You know, we try to do like a, we each have our own approach to one size fits most, but I know a lot of people who buy one of my holsters and then put more foam on it, or they put a different kind of claw on it and they make little tweaks and adjustments to the stuff that is closest to the bullseye for them. And you got to spend some time figuring, discovering A, what the bullseye is for you, B, what it takes to get there, and then C, how close you can get there with an off-the-shelf solution. So with that in mind, and for some people that this might be redundant, that this might be a little basic, but I got to, I got to consider the audience. And I also got to consider the audience that might want to use some of this as a utility that they may be able to pass information on to people that don't know better. Let's talk about positioning of a firearm along the belt, whether it be three o'clock. I don't want to go to smaller back because I don't want to bother with that. Uh, but appendix, I had a, I put together a video where basically I, I discussed going from smaller back six o'clock rotating all the way forward to 12 o'clock appendix. You're gaining a lot of benefit. You're gaining speed, better retention, better concealment, and all that let's let's delve into that um, a lot of people still don't understand why appendix is is, is there so anybody popular. is there anybody here that doesn't carry appendix oh yeah mike's the weird one okay so yeah. weird but okay. you know you, you know there's there's plenty of reasons why um I, i'm a fan of appendix don't get me wrong uh, but i still have 90 percent of my students who are carrying strong side you know um, and then when guys come to my class that are carrying appendix, you know, I'll, you see a lot of them reholster. The biggest, the biggest problem I see is the way they reholster, they reholster the wrong way. And you just take, take them to the side and show them how to reholster. Um, but in general, um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of appendix. I carried in one country, I specifically carried appendix because they would, shake hands with the right hand and the left hand would come around and they'd always hit on the hip, you know? Um, and then also walking into, uh, you know, some of the hotels, some of the, uh, 
establishments overseas and some of these other places, they're wanding you on the sides. And if they come to the front, you can, you know, show them your belt buckle or something like that. And nine times out of 10, get away with it. So uh, I am a huge fan of appendix, but again, I mean, the good portion of my students are coming through strong side only. Um, and then, I mean, let's face it, I carried strong side, you know, when I was in the military and, uh, but not, uh, I think it's a valid, definitely a valid position. I don't carry appendix. I carry belly button. My stuff is like dead set down the middle. Um, and I, I find that a lot of times uh, guys get discouraged with it because they carry appendix <clears throat> and because they're dudes. And, and when I can convert somebody to an appendix carry from strong side, they're one of their biggest complaints. It's always twig and berries, man. I'm going I'm to blow my twig and berries off. Um, once I get it past that and they start realizing that it's, well, you know, it's, I tried it and it was uncomfortable. That's because they're running it so far over to they're more two o'clock, one thirty ish than they are center line. Um, so they end up with that hot spot on the inside of their leg. They can't sit, they can't stand. It's all sorts of stuff. If they push it more center line, more, um, your sights almost running down your gig line from your belt down your zipper. Um, can't your belt a little bit for towards the 10 o'clock? Um, and, and you're far more successful. The, um, the, uh, you're going to shoot your twig and berries off day to day life. Um, the, the gun should come out of your waistband in the holster. It should, it should, it should come out and it should go on the nightstand or wherever you're going to put it at night. It should come out in the morning with your pants are on. It should go back in your waistband in the holster and it should never have to come out of the holster. So when guys are like, ah, it's, you know, you're going to shoot yourself in the junk. Um, no, because you shouldn't be touching the gun. The gun's going to go off if you apply pressure to the trigger and it's going to go bang. So if the trigger's never exposed, the gun's not going to go off. So we, uh, um, I find more and more um, in classes because guys know I'm a huge proponent of appendix. Um, if I've got 20 dudes in a class um, and there's half of them that are appendix carriers and they want to, we'll, we'll run the line with, with appendix and strong side. Um, fundamentals, everyday carry and fighting from concealment. Um, we, we do both. Um, and I've converted a lot. It's nice to see that cops specifically, um, TTPOA two years ago, OTOA quite a bit. If I have over three days, if I run full classes, I have 75 cops that I see over three days for OTOA. And, um, it's becoming more and more prevalent where for off duty, um, detective work, things like that, I will probably convert on a 24 man roster day in and day out. I'll probably convert anywhere from eight to 10 to appendix carry. Um, and it's just from a, from a security standpoint, from a speed aspect, from a concealment aspect, from um, controllability. I mean, it's just, we just go down the, we can go down the list of the reasons why it's a, um, why it's not, not necessarily superior because it's not for everybody, but it's a very viable uh, and uh, very useful uh, technique. Yeah. Adam, how about for you with your weight loss? Uh, I started out, um, you know, strong side outside the waistband carrying a phantom every day. Um, and it worked. I mean, I still had the deal with a gun bowing because being fat and having, you know, skin come over your belt line in every direction makes it relatively difficult. Um, I found that as I got smaller, the gun continually started moving more and more and more forward because I liked how fast I could access the gun. Um, I liked that I could wear better fitting clothing because I didn't have to worry about the sides being so baggy because if you look from you know square on, I'm a wider body you know squared on than I am to the side. So bringing everything center line for me, uh, it was more comfortable. It was faster. I could conceal bigger guns. I could carry spare magazines. Um, I just, it, it came, everything kind of came all together. And, um, like for me, it, it's almost ritualistic when I, when I get up in the morning, like, cause my carry gun is my nightstand gun. I will press check it goes in the holster holster will go in my pants and then where your jeans or pants overlap at the fly, the, this loop will sit right at that ridge. And that's always my reference point. So that way I have the exact same hand placement if I ever need to go to that gun at any given time. And 
yeah, I just, I have not looked back and I don't think I will ever go back to anything but appendix for daily carry because now it just feels odd. Um, like when I did Petty's class, like we were, it was running a safari land and I was like, man, it's just, it's, it's so odd to go to my side now after spending the last eight, nine months day in, day out doing dry reps from center line. So yeah, I, at this point I'm pot committed and I'm happy that way. And I don't foresee myself changing how I carry because with the holsters now running a longer run, I can find the ever need to drop to a 19. I can, but it's usually a 17 grip chop or a 34. And it's just, I like the consistency and the basicness of it and not much varies and not much changes. Yeah. I, I changed the way I do my draw from uh, three o'clock based on the way I carried and drew from concealment in an uh, in appendix. Because what I noticed is that when I would come and do a sweep with a jacket or something like that, that I was, you know, obviously much slower and I was trying to figure out breaking it down. You know, what's the biggest difference? I'm using my support hand to get the cover out of the way. And so now is what I do when I carry from, from the strong side is I actually take my support hand and I grab the cover, get it out of the way, just like I would if it were center line now. And I'm actually faster. So, um, you know, I did learn a lot about my draw, my, my, my strong side carry from carrying and training appendix too. I guess no one else wants to talk about appendix. Oh, uh, one thing that, <laughs> one thing that I've, I've noticed is that for a number of years, so not every idea if ever, every, every concept has a, has a number of associated ideas and um, uh, uh, concepts that, 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 that come with it. And they don't all change over at the same time. So one of the things that was prevalent for a number of years leading up to the appendix resurgence was there was a, uh, uh, when sort of three o'clock carry had some, some, some primacy previously, there was a move to stiffer belts, right? So st stiffer belts helped keep the gun from tipping away from the body. They, especially when you're carrying, um, in, especially carrying outside the waistband, but it also helps for inside the waistband. The, the stiffer the belt, the less outward tip you got when carrying at, at three o'clock and the more stuff you could put on the belt. As people switch to appendix carry, that was a recommendation and a policy that was slow to change. So people were on the, you gotta have a stiff belt, you gotta have a stiff belt, you gotta have a stiff belt. And I kind of stuck with it for a while too, especially because I was making my holsters pretty tight for a while. And I'm like, well, you need a stiff belt to overcome how, how tight the holster is. And I've been experimenting with over the past several years, variations in belt weight as I explore and, you know, spend time with appendix carry. And I've found that one of the issues that some number of people have, depending on their anatomy, is that they'll still have their stiff belt from three o'clock carry, but the issue is how much it conforms to their body. And in the event that their anatomy is such that in the front, the, the, best, the belt will crest over their pelvis and leave a gap, and then it sort of um, contacts the front of their body, instead of pressing the, the gun into the body and activating like the claw or the wedge feature of the gun, the belt will remain stiff. And when you attach the gun to the belt, it actually pulls the gun to the belt to a certain degree. And I've noticed things like... Um, uh, so for example, if you've got too stiff of a belt in combination with uh, a holster, like an incog, which has the, um, the canted clips that gives you a permanent clearance between the belt and the face of the holster in such a way that the, the holster comes out over the belt entirely under certain circumstances. And in some contexts where, um, a holster is made in order to have like claw and wedge features, 
instead of the belt tightening down in a way that conforms to the gun in the holster, engages the claw feature, and then presses the grip of the gun into the body, it pulls all of those things out to the radius of the belt. So um, I find a lot of folks have, it, that also creates comfort issues too, because as it pulls the gun away, it also tips out. And if you've installed like a wedge feature on the gun, you're decreasing the comfort of that because it's not contacting your body correctly. So I think some of the support equipment needs to change. Some of the recommendations probably need to change a little bit. And it's also definitely going to be highly user dependent, you know, so that's not going to be something that you can say to everybody, but <clears throat> you field a lot of customer service emails when you're dealing with holsters because they're specific to people's anatomy and people buy them with certain expectations and they want them to be perfect because they've tried a million of them. So you get roped into a lot of emails with customers trying to help them reach the point at which they're satisfied with concealed carry in general. And um, more and more, I find that there's at least some correlation between dissatisfaction with uh, appendix carry performance or, you know, it doesn't meet, you know, a, a, a failure to meet expectations. And that correlates to uh, ultra stiff gun belts. Not 100%, but I'd say, you know, of you know, there's, there's probably like a 20 to 30% correlation between dissatisfaction with appendix carry and belt selection. And so I've been making a number of recommendations based on that. I was supposed to get a new belt today um, uh, to try and like continue to explore that. I've been playing with the Volan Gearworks belt for a little while. I think it might be a little too much on the thin side. Uh, I've got a, one of the new Grace specialists coming. Should have arrived today. I think that's got some some juice to it. And I think that uh wilderness for as long as they've been around might still even constitute a pretty decent sweet spot for um the appendix carry belt the other the other issue is belt buckle placement so i try to encourage people to go for the lowest profile buckle they can if not offset it from their 12 o'clock because one of the things is that if you've got a super stiff belt with a big giant buckle, that's all going to print out the front of your body and you have to work around that a little bit. So you got to offset the belt buckle. You got to work with a belt that might be a different kind of thickness, depending on your anatomy. And, um, it's another one of those things that's like, it's, it's, I'd feel bad for anybody who was getting into this today and didn't already have like a group of friends who have like a bunch of shit laying around that they could play with. Like that's one of my, that's one of my major recommendations now. Like, do you have friends who are also on this journey with you? Mix and match all your shit. Taste a little bit off of everybody's plate and see a little bit uh, what works for you so you don't have to, you know, buy the whole menu to taste everything. Yes, yeah, I'm on. I'm on the other side of the fence. I am. Uh, I didn't have a very stiff belt. Whenever I would carry strong side, um, my first rigid belt was a, a Ranger belt from Aries Gear, and then um, when the Aegis and Aegis and Hand started coming around, I, I was already deep into into appendix carry from there. So I was carrying appendix carry on a Ranger belt, and then with the um, Aegis and Aegis and Hands. And for me, and again, it's, I know you said that it's, that it's body size dependent. For me, with a, even with an Aegis, because of the, the way I run my holster, it's got double overhooks. I want it to take up as much of the overhooks as I can, so that way the gun doesn't shift at all. It is, it is repeatability, so every time I go for my gun, it's going to be in the same, it's going to be in that same spot every single time. I even have them to the point where it's canted, so it actually pinches on the belt itself. Yeah. But then when you look at the fact that when I, when I cinch my belt down, that's, that's a, the, one of the first Sentinel uh, Clint Lynch magwells. That's hard coat anodized. That's rubbed off. My skin has rubbed that off because it tucks this gun in so tight to my body. So it's a, um, from a cleaner 
presentation because it's there the same well, my master grip is is repeatable every single time cleaner presentation because the, the belt and the holster sits there um from uh, de-escalation if i have to be able to put the gun away not that i ever put it away fast on an appendix carry but it's it's there um so for me it's it's a it's still an enhancement i i, I don't wear an aegis enhanced anymore but i still need that thickness um and that offset that full inch and a half in that, that offset because when I cinch the belt down, it does activate the claw on the wedge, which, which allows me to now conceal a 17 with a magwell, and it's um, it sits so tight that I don't even have hair on my on my stomach where that thing rides, and it's and it's rubbed that hard coat anodizing off. So it's um, for me, it's still a, a still a stiff belt. If I've tried to wear a um, the very first <clears throat> Victory Aegis that Gene made for me when I said, "Hey, I'm going to send you a buckle. I need I need a, a leather belt because I need." I need it for funerals. I need it for meetings and stuff like that. I was still carrying appendix carry, um, and it worked, and it worked very well. But that belt, as time has carried on, um, it's leather. It's a dead cow, and it's going to return to the earth. So it, I get a little bit more play because it's leather, uh, where the um, where the scuba webbing on on the Aegis and Aegis Enhanced don't, don't give me that. There's I've got one of the very first Aegis that came out, and it's uh, it is still. It, it, the way it conforms to my body, it sits on my body and knows exactly where it needs to be. It's like a, it's like a well-worn pair of boots for me. Yeah. I've noticed that with belts that are too thin, uh, no matter what you're using, whether or not it's clips or clips, clips or loops, the belt will collapse within the clip or the loop and you'll get some shifting. And then the other problem is that around the back of your body, it starts to bow inward and actually contact you in a narrower way. So instead of resting against your, say this is your back and this is the belt, the belt doesn't sit flat against your back. It starts to bow inward and you get a really hot spot around your lower back and your pelvis. So, so there are a number of belts that I believe are too thin, like a single ply belt. It might be flexible. It might conform to your body, but God, if it doesn't fucking dig into my back after a certain amount of time, it, it just yeah. gets kind of brutal. And then it's, and guys get discouraged because if they have a too thin of a belt and it's not rigid enough, and it doesn't provide that support. If they have a substandard holster, if they haven't done their, their homework on a holster and, and have um, a, a a terrible clip there, I mean, there's there's a handful of them out there that uh, I've seen more end up at the three-yard line or shoot at the seven-yard line because they come out and the holster comes out with it and ends up downrange or they've got to pull off because they're, they're, they're belt substandard. So it's, um, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a creature habit. I stick with, with the things that work and those things have worked for, for years, but I see what you're saying about, about a difference, but it's for me, I'm still on the, I'm, I'm on the stiff belt train still. It's good. It's going to, it's something that I discover is individually, uh, individually variable. So like some folks, you know, I've, I was, uh, I was hanging out with a friend of mine who's like super fit. And I'm like, yo, dude, you're aware that your gun prints like shit through your shirt. He's like, really? I've got this great belt and this great holster. And I'm like, and I just grabbed a belt that was thinner and more flexible, threw it on, and it was an immediate reduction in printing because he's, you know, he's shaped like this and his belt is shaped like that. So the belt scribes a, a larger diameter circle than his pelvis does. And there wasn't anything he could do to, to shrink that. It was like he was wearing a wagon wheel, you know? And so that resulted in him, you know, he had, you know, he had the crests on his hips and his pelvis. So give him something that's a little bit more flexible and it actually starts to match his body. So, you know, your belt's got to match your body. And if that, if, and if you're depending on the size and shape of your body, that might mean a stiff belt. And the narrower you get, I think the, the, the more flexible your, your, your belt becomes as a rough rule of thumb. What about providing creases into that stiff belt to help that square shape versus uh, maintaining the circular oval shape. What, like strap well, your see, belt? There, there's a break your belt in, to there's a phone a, book. What was that? There's a break-in period too. Some some of that yeah. material just needs to get wet. Um, it's a um, you know I get a new pair of cowboy boots. It doesn't matter what they are. If if I'm on the road and I buy a new pair of boots, I get in the hotel room. I draw a tub full of water and I get in there and stand in them and then walk around with with them wet. You know, it's it's like breaking in a baseball glove. It's breaking in a new pair of boots. It's breaking in a belt. Um, 
So it's uh yeah, if you if you get an Aegis enhanced and you put it on and you're you're a buck oh five and you're not hitting cracker barrel three times a week, then sure it's probably gonna it's gonna it's gonna be like you're you're doing the hula hoop at uh, America's Got Talent, but um you know, get, give it a little bit of a chance and, and see if you can make that thing work. Yeah, I was thinking if you took the belt and forced not necessarily right angles, but uh, help it conform to your body a little bit more. I wonder if that would be a, a solution. Because I'm also thinking of the part of the, the reason to, to wear a belt is load bearing. So if I have any any type of additional weight beyond the uh, beyond the gun, I'd like the belt to be able to support that. Yeah. It's it's going to depend a little bit on where you place it on your body. Yeah. Um, what materials you're using to support it, you know, uh, what what the pouches are made out of, whether or not there's any kind of like traction involved in those materials, how much those things weigh, uh, whether or not you're engaged, you know, do you put everything up front? Are some things like counterbalanced, you know, you, do, you, do you put a, a mag behind the hip instead of in front of the hip? You know, that's going to change how the load's distributed across the belt and how that interacts with your body. So there's a, there's a lot to play around with. You know, some people put like a little bit of like micro suede on the back of a, a holster or a mag pouch to prevent it from sliding down your undershirt and underpants. And so that changes how much you expect the belt to carry to a certain degree. Because if, if everything's not sliding, then all it really needs to do is kind of hold it to your body in a certain way, you know? There's a lot of strategies, you know, so. <clears throat> so you brought up uh, an issue with the INCOG. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about some materials and some design flaws that seem to be really popular. Hybrid holsters, for example, being, in my opinion, that's a flawed idea. You have two different types of materials. One is more pliable than the other. They're going to wear differently. With that wearing, you're also going to be losing some passive retention. And it's, and, and potentially uh, some issues with your uh, trigger guard getting some leather or something into that trigger guard. Well, it's a, some, some of the hybrids are okay for, for start out stuff. The problem you have is just like I, I talked about with, with a leather belt. It's a... Uh, it used to be on a living animal. Living animals, once they die, try to return to the earth. Um, specifically, when I when I talk to cops, I've got my big bag of holsters that I've said, "Look, these are these are the mistakes I've made over the last twenty years." And uh, there's some stuff in there, and and it's um, a hybrid holster could be a viable holster if we were grown up enough to realize when it's unserviceable. When yes. that leather starts curling over because you're in you're in a you're in a humid climate, um, you got too much tactical ballast. Um, you're spending too much time with the the gun out of the holster while it's on. Um, the the heat, the sweat, the the rain, whatever else starts curling that thing over. To to be man enough to look at it and go, you know, this is this is no longer serviceable. I got to throw it out and buy another one for for eighty bucks, ninety bucks, one hundred forty bucks, whatever whatever it is. Um, it's just not going to be that way uh, because. Uh, because we need a new windscreen for the street glide, or we need, you know, the boat needs to get waxed. We need that money to go somewhere else. We don't want to buy another holster because we have one. Um, but, uh, I need more Chrome for the scooter and I need another, another tube for the kids for the lake or, you know, um, don't, don't want to spend the money where it needs to be spent. So if you're not going to be grown up enough to say, all right, well, this, is, this is no good. Um, it's, it's served me well for 18 months, 24 months, 36 months. I got to throw it out, then go spend hundred dollars one time and uh, and be good with it there's uh there's plenty of stuff out there that'll that'll last that uh, that doesn't have dead cow on it Kritzer, who was supposed to be on this episode but had some stuff come up i was we were having a conversation talking about a, a specific hybrid holster <clears throat> and uh basically people told him you got to try this out this is the most comfortable thing i've ever carried he put it on and immediately realized there is no way in hell I can get a, a, a good grip on this. Just the design itself, that, that the priority was comfort, not on performance. That's huge, man. You see that all the time. You know, I, I hear people, 
you know, they use that for an excuse of why they don't carry appendix. They say it's uncomfortable or why they don't carry a certain type of a gun because it's uncomfortable. You know, I think it was Clint Smith. I heard him say years ago, uh, guns are designed to be comforting, not comfortable. Um, and uh, I think someone else earlier said, you know, you've got to work around your gear. You know, you've got to make it work for you. Um, I, I mean, I know most guys here are carrying appendix, but, you know, what about, I mean, do you, do you modify your gear? Obviously, if you're carrying a suit, you know, if you're wearing a suit that day. You know, I mean, either way, the point is you have to modify something. Um, it may not be comfortable, but as long as you can access it, you know, you're going to do what you need to do. And training, again, being a big part of that, you know. Um, so here's a here's a big question. You know, we, we've talked about stuff that makes it a little bit better to, you know, to manage the everyday um you know, tasks that we have concealing a large firearm or a sizable firearm, right? And uh, like what specific gear can help with that? You know, you know, what maybe what is stuff that just completely doesn't work? Uh, what stuff that really doesn't work in the context of when <laughs> shit gets real? Um, you know, uh, you know, if that if that points at like the pros and cons of some designs, it's, it's kind of interesting. But um, um, are are you trying to segue us into talking about the full concealed folding Glock? <laughs> oh boy, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, I was going to talk about it more in the context of like holsters and stuff like that, and you know, like what what is something that just really does not pan out, and like say something like ECQC or or just real world experience that maybe you get feedback from that that we're not privy to, right? Or, you know, I know Varg dipped out of here, but, you know, it would have been really interesting to hear his take on, like, what is some of the stuff that just absolutely just does not fucking work, right, in the context of his background. That would have been cool. Um, but, do, you guys re do you guys remember the handgun sling? It's like a piece of bungee cord, basically, that you just, yeah. like, hang in your belt. I told that dude on his Facebook page that this thing was incredibly dangerous. Like the, the product demonstration video is the dude like muzzling his own hand behind his back with a loaded gun. I, I, I'm like, listen, man, you honestly just, you can't sell this to people and tell them it's a holster. Like that's really irresponsible. And I'm telling you now, you've been warned. If somebody shoots themselves with this thing, I'll be at the trial as their expert witness about how dangerous your thing is. I got banned from the page, but I felt like that needed to be said. And like, if you're putting out something that's that, that's that clearly dangerous, someone should warn you so you don't have an excuse. Like, that's just so egregious. Like, that fucking VersaCarry is like... It, it, it doesn't cover the trigger. You're putting shit in the muzzle. Uh, Not, not there, all here there's, the, game, right? there's like a, a whole like tier of just dangerously ill-conceived innovation that's like I don't know how the person who writes their liability insurance looks at their product and goes sure we'll give you a policy <laughs> this is nothing bad will happen here yeah yeah um, Probably should have brought that up. He'd, he'd asked, why does he need insurance? Yeah, well, if it's, when, when, when someone with three fingers on one hand types an email to you about how they fucking shot themselves, you're going to really appreciate that you bought the insurance. Like, what do you think? You think, you think you're selling this product to rocket scientists, don't you? You're selling this to somebody who doesn't realize how bad who, at, like you, doesn't realize how bad an idea this is, you know there's going to be consequences. Like, you're selecting for people who are more inclined to hurt themselves. Yeah. You know, that, I think I mean, there, there's some stuff that really doesn't pan out, right? You know, you see it oftentimes, you get those news articles in Mexican carry or something like that, and somebody, you know, pops around to their leg or something or worse, right? Um you know, twigs and berries, Matt was talking about that, but, um, but you know, that, that's, that's kind of the whole thing is like, there's some stuff that just really does not work. Right. And, um, 
it, it's strange. I, I think I've been maybe lucky or just because the choices are constrained for, for what I use, right? Like, you know, there's two designs that have seemed to have been really solid. There's a couple of design parameters that have seemed to, seemed to be really solid as far as like an appendix holster goes. So it's like you're in a clinch and somebody's sitting on top of you, you can still get to it. The holster's not collapsing or anything like that. That's cool. Um, it just seems like something to pay attention. I don't know if it's like the most important thing, um, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what are some, some design flaws that just absolutely do not work um, that, that are popular maybe for whatever reason, but, but they're just not, not great. And we were talking about like a, you know, laminated holster or something with like a leather interior or whatever, but, but like are, are there other designs that are just patently bad? I don't think that holsters with the big single wide flat plastic clip on the face of the holster are for serious work. Yeah. They like, the, like, like the kind that that's got two screws in the front of it and it's got one tooth at the bottom and it's about, you know, it's like a double wide clip and it and just, uh, one, one of the issues is that there's a substantial like that. I don't, I'm not generally super impressed by those. I think those take a lot of specific things to get right in order to work properly. There's a large number of makers who don't understand how much they need to shim the top of it in order to get the bottom to claw into the, the, the underside of the belt. Yes. And it, I've seen too many of those come off the belt too easily. Yes. The, uh, those are those are the exact clips that I was talking about being on the seven yard line, and and after we call target, and then they got to walk down to the three yard line to pick them up. Are those clips right there? It happens all it happens all the time, and it's uh, I end up handing out more holsters for guys to borrow at nine thirty than I, I I would at seven thirty because they they don't know. If the person building that holster isn't acutely aware of the geometry that needs to be in place in order to make that clip sufficiently aggressive. Like <clears throat> you'll see that um, the, the, the clip bolts through to the top of the holster, the place where it bolts into needs to be angled in such a way that it forces the clip inward at the bottom aggressively to the point where it becomes hard to take off the belt. A lot of them keep the, the body of the holster parallel to the clip and it just kind of like floats out there and the belt can almost pass through the space between the holster and the gun. I think that the it should be made in such a way that it's hard to separate the clip from the body of the holster at the tooth end. And even then I don't especially trust them. I don't I don't see them as I don't see them implemented successfully enough. Most of the people who are using them, I think, are, so you are, I, th I think you are showing us a, a, a keepers. No, this is not a keeper. I want to be oh. really clear on okay. that. So I, yeah, I, 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 holster. So this okay. is, yeah, I see them. I think the keepers errand uses them and I'm almost certain that Spencer is aware of the criteria that need to be in place to make that clip successful. Yeah. But I also believe that he's one of a single digit number of exceptions in terms of holster makers who pay close enough attention to that technical uh, criteria for that clip. Most of the people, like you go to a gun show and you see them on a table and they've got them clips on them. That's like, a, that's a, that's a gun that's, that, that you pick up next to your car when you come out of the mall and discover that it's fallen off of you. Yep. Like, like that, yeah. th those are fucking. Yeah. This is, uh, um, you know, it's interesting in a lot of these holsters what you can take is you can replace like the clip with the soft loops that, that seems to work. Yeah. You know, generally it'll be, it'll be good enough. It, it's, this is a well, well designed enough holster. I'm not going to say that the, the maker on it, but, um, um, but it, you know, they're, I think they're aware of the problem, but, but yeah, that is, that is part of the, part of the issue. Stuff falling off the belt is certainly no good. Um, you know, a good solid loop, I think is really, really interesting. I haven't played around with a lot of clip designs just because the holster that I got has a solid loop and that's all it had. And well, okay. Um, 
but uh, you know, I think it's um, you know, one thing I was talking about before is like holsters that actually are are like closed on the bottom. They, you know, if somebody's laying on top of you, it seems that you can still draw the gun out of there, which is which is kind of a plus. I've seen holsters that are kind of like open so that they can do kind of like what blade tech does you just put your rubber like washers in there or whatever and then tighten them down that's your retention that stuff just seems to kind of like collapse to a certain degree and just make it really almost impossible to draw the whole like the holster binds on the gun for some whatever reason um but uh that, that, that's kind of kind of interesting um i don't know um I wish I knew more about that gear aspect, but, but uh. in regards to, you know, you were saying what, what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, when I was overseas, I was, I had, uh, my first inside the waistband that I was using was, uh, the blade tech with the snaps. Mm -hmm. And then I got a clip and then, uh, inside the car, you know, it came undone and I swore I would never, ever use a clip again. And, uh, you know, then up here in Northern Virginia, you know, constantly going into federal buildings where I can't take a firearm. So I have to leave it in the car. And I found that the clip works best. So, I mean, I'm fortunate that I got a, uh, a JM Customs and the clip works really well. But, uh, you know, I, I think um, John hit the nail on the head. It depends on the holster. Um, but if I were to tell somebody or if I were in a position where I could carry a gun into a federal building or into some place legally, then I would recommend, you know, either the, uh, the loops or, you know, a, a, you know, a regular belt loop, you know, because it's going to stay in a lot better or easy, you know, or be harder to, uh, to get out. What about the, uh, the design that has the integrated magazine pouch? That's all one big piece that, tends to break come on say the name you know you want to say it come on we all we all know who we're talking about go ahead come on it's t-rex arms come on everybody wanted to say it nobody's willing to man up and say it i'm not i thought it was uncle mike's uh we're, we're talking about the like the gigantic kydex ones that uh are like one big piece that you wear appendix hey, kydex cod piece what Every, every time I see those, I think sometimes it's possible to look at a product and know that that is the initial idea for that concept that somebody executed. Instead of thinking several iterations of development through the process, sometimes you can look at a product and tell that that the people who designed it thought about it and that the 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 end result that you're seeing has the story of the design written on it that they add certain features for certain reasons and they work together in a specific way and that it's considered and you can you can almost see the people designing it in the design and then other times you look at something and you can tell that it was a execution based on the first idea like hey let's let's just mold the mag carrier straight into it okay and now we're off to the races and the gigantic monolithic plastic uh appendix carry integrated mag carrier holsters strikes me as one of those things that is the first idea that skips straight to execution because i feel like even a brief consideration of the concept would lead you to a number of changes which is why we already see people doing like a version two of it where it's like two pieces and they're flexible right like that exists because it's the immediately obvious next question to ask like that's what they should have been in the first place i'm not even convinced that that's necessarily the the best idea because I, I'm convinced that based on human anatomy, the 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 ana the, the, the analysis and the dis and the and the conclusions you would arrive at as a result of actually thinking through the design are that these two things need to have a completely independent relationship to each other 
because of the variations in human anatomy and the way the body actually moves. Like your legs move independently. And when one leg moves, that part of your body shifts and your, your pelvis twists and you need to do a number of things. And like, if you need to bend down and touch your opposite shoe, you like the entire structure of your hips and your belly and the tops of your legs are all going to collide in an interesting and complicated way that requires these things, even if they're attached to be able to be independently user adjustable in terms of height, angle and offset from each other. And that's just obvious on the face of it. And that's how you prevent them from breaking. That's how you get them to conceal better. That's how you get them to fit more people better. Like the, the, these are things that we are install. Like, you know, I got to say though, it might be great for a very, 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 very specific body type. That's not I, right. I, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. But I think for the more one person, or one person, yeah. Uh, the the more we th discuss the considerations of concealing a gun on a body, the more we're actually discussing the same considerations that are present in prosthesis. Right, like prosthesis in terms of um, prosthetic appliances, or in terms of even like costuming appliances. The way you, you know, uh, the way like costume and prop designers build uh, uh, complicated costumes, or the way that people who build medical prosthesis consider these things. And if you're not taking into consideration the 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 same ergonomic considerations, then I think you're making an enormous mistake. And you're still like, the, the closer we get to being able to reproduce the kinds of technologies and solutions that are present in customizable uh, prosthetics, the better we're gonna make concealed holsters. And one big solid immovable piece of plastic is not in the same ballpark of ergonomic considerations as a sophisticated prosthetic is. Does that make sense? Yeah, you'd like you'd like it to have an elbow or a knee is what I'm getting out of that. <laughs> no, just a bunch of fingers. I've got a question though. Like, I mean, do they break? I mean, is this... Yeah. I don't know. They crack right down the middle. Right, right where they're... So imagine we've, you're, you're looking at the muzzle end of it. You've got the gun and the mag, right. and then it's got a bend and a crease down the middle. Yeah. The split occurs down the middle of these things and sort of cracks in the outer face. Yeah. Of the holster. Is that, I mean, that doesn't necessarily affect like something like, I think, uh, who is it? The, uh, the people that make the Aegis. Like, I think that's the, uh, the other holster that's really similar, but it's got like a flexible piece in the middle. I've seen those. I mean, I, I think that's a, uh, making them two pieces mitigates the uh, potential for them to crack. And I, and I think that's a smart move, but I think that if you're missing out on the potential to adjust them independently, you're still not taking the idea to its reasonable conclusion. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I think this is, um, you know, I can see some, just from the pure, like going for the gun aspect, I can see some things that are beneficial, like having a magazine that cantilevers, you know, essentially like the weight of the gun up. It creates also a bigger footprint to actually like try and, you know, if you have a wedge or something like that. I could see that being maybe a positive thing. I've never played with one of those. Um, well, here's here's the there's the technical issue. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a a gun. Well, imagine we're looking at the muzzle end of it. We've got a gun and we've put a wedge on this, uh, a claw on the side, and we use that claw to angle the grip of the gun inward, mm -hmm. right? You want to kind of have like a fulcrum or, or a wedge feature on the sight channel end of it that it helps you tip it over that way. Right. If you extend a magazine off the side, what that does is that anchors the, the gun. Now, when you tighten your belt and activate the claw feature, you're now bringing the magazine outward, right? They're attached. And the magazine itself resists the claw that you install 
on the holster side. And that sets up a certain amount of tension that reduces the degree to which the gun will ever conceal and instigates the crack in the body of the holster. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. It's it's like it's like if when you attach the magazine to it, you're basically just putting another claw on the other side of the gun. Yeah, it does this does the same thing as 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 the claw feature that you've installed on the holster. Mm. Neat. Any other examples of designs that are problematic from anyone other than Serpa? Because we know that one. That one we don't need to talk about. Because if you don't have one, I, the next topic I have is support equipment. What is the uh, optimally for your daily carry? What is your support equipment being medical or knife or flashlight or spare mag and why? Uh, I'll actually be right back. I'll let you guys get started on this. Oh, I see how you are, so, Mike. What do you have? Yeah. I mean, I, I carry a I carry a um, a streamlight to, uh, with a AAA, um, and I've got a rechargeable battery in there that increases the uh, the loom coming out there. So I think it's probably well over a hundred. But um, and then I carry a um, um, not Spydeco, but a bird bird knife. Yeah, a pocket knife and. Uh, I carry it three inches or less. You know, you get those all over the place. Uh, I have a couple laying around, but I, I get them online. They're really expensive, but um, I use them as tools. And the other thing is because I travel overseas so much, my biggest concern is, you know, buying a, an expensive knife and getting it taken away at customs or, you know, on the street by some uh, bad cops or something like that. So I carry those around. Um, you know, I, I make sure I always have my cell phone on me. I carry an extra mag. Uh, I have an inside the waistband from uh, JM Customs uh, inside the waistband extra mag holder that I carry, um, and uh, I carry a uh, X. What's that? That Surefire XC3 or the XC1 um, light. I think that's sufficient for uh, concealed carry. Um, and uh, you know, I have a. a I have my rats tourniquet that I, I don't always carry with me, but it's usually where I, you know, put my change and stuff like that. So sometimes I'll put it in my pocket. Um, that's about it for, yeah. And then I carry stuff in the car. Like a helmet and, and plates and a rifle. And I, I'm, well, that was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, you were joking. Some, and a bow and arrow. And a bow and arrow. Okay. Well, no, that's for 19th. 19th group. They're the bow and arrow guys. Yeah. I, I saw the video, the old film strip. Yeah. Oh, you know, back when back when we were clearing rooms, you know, we'd come out one one arrow at a time, and we transitioned from, the, uh, from that to the tomahawk. <laughs> See, now that's history. That's good history there. So, Matt, the, the subject right now is... Uh, what support equipment do you do you optimally carry daily? Mag, flashlight, knife, medical, gun, spare gun? Uh, no, not on me. Knife, flashlight, and spare mag. So I've got forty rounds on me when I when I'm running around. Um, and one of the things that I specifically talk to guys about the I am uh, I'm a realist. When when I'm leaving, I don't always put on a spare mag carrier. Um, I, I carry a spare magazine with that uh, Aaron Donald Plus plate on my, put it in my back pocket with my phone. Keeps it straight up. It's in the same spot every single time. My phone is in my back pocket. The mag is, is in between the phone and my back pocket. So I can index it just like a magazine pouch. Um, but it's a, you know, if I'm just going to leave and, I, and, I, and I'm going to go out for a short period of time, um, and I, I train a lot that way. On the range today, that's what I was training. And I, and I encourage guys to when they come out on the range with me and we have the, the, the come to Jesus moment in the moment of, um, Hey, who carries a spare mag? Who, who doesn't, who, who's training with the gun that they normally carry, who, who, who came out here and brought their Glock 43. Cause they think it's a good thing, but they normally carry. So it's a, uh, um, yeah, spare mag knife, 
um, Surefire handheld light and uh, and then Med. Med is um, Med's one of those things. I'm still trying. To, I'm still looking for the the optimum way to carry it all on, on my person. Um, I've there's uh, somebody that has stuff coming out that I've seen and played with that I'm I'm waiting on that I think is going to be a better solution. But it's uh, I don't have that right now. So. Um, that I'm not going to put everybody under the friend DA because I've got an NDA. So we're going to leave it at that. <clears throat> Les, how about you? But it's uh, it, Oh, go ahead. Spare, spare mag a hundred percent. I'm sorry. The, uh, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's, I don't want guys lying when they come to me and, and I'm, I'm also guilty of, of grabbing guys when they show up for class. And as soon as I see him get out and I pop the trunk, I walk over to him and I ask him what's going on. Well, I'm getting ready for class. Come on down here wrong whatever you got on right now that's how we're going to do it and it's you know inevitably they show up to a class and they're they're taking off the stuff that they had or they drove a marked cruiser to the class and now they got to put a gun on even though they were just driving around and with uh with all their giddy up stuff on and they, they got to get in the back and get dressed for the rodeo and it's not it's, it's uh, i'm trying to help them change their mindset of hey if you're you know don't don't carry one thing to class and then take it off and try and change up something else because you were um because guys are lazy plain and simple so it's I, I try and at least insert some realism to it and say look I, I don't always carry a spare magazine or a spare mag pouch I put it in my pocket uh, it's in the most optimal pocket I have my my jeans have two back pockets and that's what I use so it's um it's Larry gear yeah for me uh, especially if I'm in a patrol car and if I happen to be wearing normal clothes like I did today um I'm carrying something that you know what, if, if I get into a fight, this is going to be something I'm going to be happy. I'm going to, I'm carrying, and it is a full size. I got 22 rounds and this in the pocket, another 22 rounds. Um, I'm not a big fan of carrying something little tiny, a little tiny mouse gun, unless I have to as a backup. Yeah, I'll carry that. I carry the 43. As a matter of fact, I carry a, 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 a micro Roland as my backup a Glock 43. But uh, when I'm carrying, it's this, these are things that I'm comfortable in shooting. These are things that I practice with on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, one week ago, I went and shot uh, Micro Roland and shot a box of practice and a, a box of duty. I don't know. I, I don't know if many people do that, but it practice with what you carry kind of important. Yeah, I, I uh, one thing I I got from the the competition community was you know most guys at the higher level have two guns. They have a practice gun and a competition gun. And then they bring their practice gun to the range for the match. And if their primary or match gun goes down, now they have a backup. So I bought the same gun that I carry and I train with that. So, you know, I, I put some rounds through it. And if, if a spring breaks or something like that, I'm not worried about it because that's my training gun. Then I had the exact same one that I carry, and I hardly, hardly ever shoot it. I shoot it, do a functions check, maybe a magazine a year, but in general, I don't shoot that gun. You know, um, and it's just because I want to. I want to train as much as possible with. And now, the one thing I have noticed though is there's a big difference now in, in the wear and tear on the trigger. So that's why at least once a year I'll make sure I get some uh, at least a magazine to that my actual carry gun. But I definitely am a huge advocate of, of training with the same type of firearm that you carry. One of the early lessons I learned from uh, Chuck Haggard was have have multiples of what you use and what you carry. So yeah, I have two thirty fours, two PO nines, two nineteens. Yeah. yeah, just another another excuse to buy a gun, you know, and of course another excuse to buy another holster. <laughs> So, so do you have two Langdon 92s yet? No. No. Yet. Yet. Well, I was but, surprised at how hot it got after shooting a couple yeah. hundred rounds in a row. D depends what you do. Um, yeah, it's nice, especially in the Chicago winters. It was a nice junk warmer. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, carrying appendix, right? But, um, yeah, you know, it was kind of, yeah. I think you're onto something, Mike. Like, I mean, that, that's the that's the trick, right? 
is uh, even if you're a like a limited shooter, if you're carrying like a 1911, that's probably closer platform wise. Like I think a, I think that's pretty common. I know there's some open guys who you know, you know shoot the open gun and practice with their open gun and whatever, and then they you know carry a Glock, you know, kind of EDC, but you know, it varies. But but um, I think there's something to that. If you have a chance to to you know shoot what you shoot in competition and carry the same thing, I think that really pays dividends. And I think that's one of the the big things. That, I don't want to speak for Gabe White, but but uh, that's one of the the big reasons that he competes with what he's got is because it is so. It is what he carries, and that's that, that's pretty cool. Um, I'll be honest. I, right before this, I said I lost my babysitter um, for for the evening. Had to come back home right to do the podcast. But we were over at Grandma's house, and they live about three blocks away. So I walk back in flip flops and, and shorts and uh, swimmies and, and everything. And uh, you know, it's an LCR in a pocket. I feel okay, you know, in the three blocks and here in Sarasota to get home. I think I'm okay, right? I, my threat model will, will, you know, accommodate for that. And, uh, um, but, uh, but yeah, and we t- kind of touched on it. You know, I carry a keepers and 92. It's like one of the only companies that makes like an appendix holster for, for the Breda. It's cool. It works. Um, lately I've been shooting the same gun in practice and in matches is it's actually the carry gun. Um, it, it was kind of the only one that I had that was just a stock unit, like a stock 92. Um, so that was kind of cool, but um, got a couple a couple of backups to that now, which is good. But yeah, it's kind of stopped shooting all the brig slides and and you know vertex slide guns that I've got. They're just they're sitting in the safe for now. But yeah, but uh, yeah, now, there's there's a lot that uh, you know back when I was in the military that we learned from the the, the competition guys. We'd have you know the grandmasters back in the day to date myself, you know, like Jerry Barnhart and Frank Garcia, you know, come to Fort Bragg and, you know, they would train us and we would take their competition techniques and modify them for, you know, the, the way we carried our gear. And then, you know, when I got out and started carrying concealed, then I started doing the same type of stuff, you know, taking the, the practice regime regimes, you know, the, the other techniques that they would use the dry fire techniques and just started incorporating them into dry fire or into my concealed carry and it's you know it's really worked out you know i mean um you know from from strong side i can with with good dry fire practice i can get down to sub second draws from you know strong side and there are people out there that said no that just that can't be done you know consistently or regularly i'm like yeah it can be done through dry fire live fire and just regular practice, you know, um, I mean, it's much easier for me to do it from appendix, but my goal was to do it from strong side because I have so many people that I train that, that do it from strong side. But you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, there's, there's a lot to be learned from the competition community for, um, you know, everyday carry, you know, the guys that are out there winning are, you know, shooting from the same type of holster all the time. So if I'm going to carry concealed, I want to make sure I have the same holster all the time or as close or replicated as much as possible. My draw stroke stays the same regardless of what I'm wearing. If I'm wearing a t-shirt or a suit jacket, my draw stroke stays the same. And again, something that I've tried to pick up from the competition community because they're constantly, you know, consistency, continuity, you know, equals results. Um, And, you know, I've learned through self-discovery of dry fire that what works from uh, uh, my um, my production rig doesn't necessarily work for my concealed uh, my concealment rig. So, for example, I'm a huge fan of you know doing my reloads up in front of my face, you know, when I'm shooting production. But I found through discovery of dry fire, which you know I got my dry fire technique from competition, um, that I end up being a little bit lagging getting the concealment garment out so this hand actually comes down a little bit lower so now i'm down here by the time it gets there um but i never never ever would have gotten that far without learning that from uh from competition and i think you know like yourself uh, les and uh gabe white who are shooting competition matches from concealment i think that's another thing we're going to start seeing more of in the future where people are going to learn and take what they've learned 
in a match or in training and we'll start seeing that eventually in the community i mean just just like like red dots you know i mean years ago no one was carrying red dots you know it was, oh it's that's just competition and now you see a lot of folks shooting red dots a lot of cheaters shooting red dots i mean a lot of folks shooting red dots <laughs> If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah, right. Scott's not on here, so we can kick him all we want, right? But, uh, um, you know, I think that's it's interesting. I think that's, uh, you know, if maybe anybody who's out there, you know, listening still awake, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, go do it, right? Go go take the stuff that you would, that you would really consider, you know, like if you're carrying now, stop. Think about what you got. Go do a match. You know, shoot limited minor and see how that shakes out. That's pretty cool, so. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of food for thought there, right? So. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the other thing is, you know, I've, uh, you know, before IDPA, you know, you really didn't see guys practicing with a sheet belt in a car. But now you see folks who go to these IDPA matches, they'll have them start seated with a, you know, with a seat belt on or something like that, you know. And, you know, <laughs> it was fortunate being in the military where, you know, we could take cars on the range and try stuff like that uh but now with uh more and more folks taking more and more classes and shooting some of these other matches uh from their concealment gear you, you're seeing the, the learning curve change because that pro timer doesn't lie no no not at all i find myself um consistently seeing improvements in my shooting performance as I integrate the advice and techniques of my, you know, friends and associates and peer group and, 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 and mentors who are heavily involved in competition. I started off like my entire path here has been uh, shooting for self-defense and I started off, you know, doing, you know, shoulders forward, arms locked out, you know, thumbs forward, you know, really strong, hard isosceles grip. And anytime I encounter a, uh, a place where I feel like I, my shooting needs to get better and more consistent, someone who has some amount of competition experience will come in and give me some sort of like coaching. So I've been kind of like over the past few years, hybridizing the, the s competition derived techniques and advice into the, the self-defense stuff that I do. So I take like the self-defense context, like certain things are mandatory for self-defense. Like I need robust and consistent ways to clear the cover garment in relatively close fights, you know, with, with, within the context of there being someone who's actually trying to hurt me, not just like I'm going to, stand in the box and I'm going to blaze these paper targets. Like there's certain considerations that, that I can't abandon, like the presence of a fight. Um, however, in terms of how I modify my, my grip and my stance and my presentation past a certain point, I'm, I'm not yet at the point where I'm prepared to access the gun and then sort of like, bring it up in the sort of like very quick point A to point B uh, competition style. I still keep in mind sort of like draw with the consistency of the potential for shooting from retention in place. You know, I, my draw stroke is still a little like count one, count two, count three. I'm still like a little hung up on that. But the final position is a lot less of the sort of like turtle like tactical turtle, you know, stands. And it's a lot more based on the advice that I get from competition shooters in terms of the sort of like relaxed uh, presentation that actually does a better job of managing recoil and gets me to a consistent sight picture faster and uh, eliminates a lot of the inconsistencies that I experience with sort of like driving the gun out really aggressively. And so I've sort of brought a lot of that into my stance and into my grip and into my presentation. And that, and I'm not the fucking fastest, best shooter, but 
the fact that I'm getting 1.2 from concealment is a lot, you know, I was happy to get two, you know, in the two second ballpark from concealment with the first shot. Now I'm getting to 1.2 seconds with more accurate first shots and faster follow-up shots and better recoil control and better trigger control. And I'm on the dot better and sooner than I was before. And so the more that I integrate the sort of like finer points of what people have picked up from competition, the, the better it gets. I mean, obviously I'm not out on the street with a, some sort of competition reg. There's still the considerations of concealed carry and, and, and the, the probable fight that comes with that. But the, all the competition stuff is super valuable. And the more you synthesize that into what you're doing, I mean. Well, I think, I think you know, the, for, for people who, I think there's still maybe some people who are a bit hung up on it. I think competition is really nice. It just, it, it, you have a soft problem is while holding out the gun and, you know, doing what you need to do with the gun, which is shooting you know, the target as accurately as possible quickly. You know, people who can do it quicker and more, more consistently are people who are really well right in the scope of competition. And I think the interesting thing is if you, you know, take that, right, and this is like, it's very much like a, like a goal oriented um, way of like addressing training or addressing concealed carry or addressing like what you need to do to hide your shit, right, under your shirt, whatever. I think that it's kind of, um, um, it's easier to feed it back if you're goal oriented, if you know how to break that down to those steps and, um, and kind of make it happen. Um, I think... I think a lot of people kind of get lost in in trying to think that I need to do it, you know, this certain way, and, and stuff will be right. And it's just like, well, you know, maybe if we look at what outcome we want and work backwards from there, then it becomes a little bit easier to figure it figure it out. Um, but it's that, that's interesting. Um, you know, again, I think I think my perspective is very much coming from like a gamer side into you know, I could carry it every day, you know, whatever, you know, I could do it, you know, once the gun's out, I think I'll be all right. But that the type of cavalier attitude, I think coming back to it from, you know, a, a different, you know, a different perspective though, I think is in, in really like getting humbled a little bit by that. I think it's been good. Yeah. It's on that goal. But. I think, uh, you know, the, the, it's pretty evident. I think today for me, the, 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 the competition techniques have really infiltrated uh, defensive training in general. I think, I think, you know, Matt could probably attest to this. Uh, you know, uh, I remember, you know, before YouTube was a thing and, uh, you know, going to law enforcement and military classes as a B class USPSA shooter that, you know, I was the best shooter in the class period, you know, now as a master class production, USPSA shooter, I'll go to classes with guys who have never shot matches and are out shooting me. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? You know, and they'll see something on YouTube, uh, you know, they incorporate it in their training. And, uh, you know, so you see those getting into the, um, the defensive community and, uh, you know, some people may not know where they came from, but, you know, it's, it's fairly evident, you know, um, there's a lot of dudes at the higher levels that made a good penny as GMs, you know, coming and training some of the top tier military and law enforcement units out there. And for good reason, because like you said, shooting the target faster, more quickly is, is the best thing. And, you know, guys would say, Hey, we're not here to teach technique or tactics. We just want to teach the way to shoot the gun faster and more accurately. And we're like open, bring it, you know? And uh, I think we, we've learned as a whole, we've I mean, we've progressed, you know, I mean, like I said, some of these kids out there, you see them shooting, you're like, oh my gosh, where did you, did you shoot matches? And we're like, nope. Like, wow, dude, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. I think YouTube has been like maybe some of the biggest boom for this. Um, I, I dare say Instagram too, you know? Like no. It's really, um, it's really like, it's lit the fire under a lot of people's ass though, honestly, which is, which is pretty cool, but. Well, I'm worried about the motivation, though. What's the motivation to light that? 
is it to get better or is it to get likes and look cool i don't know i mean you know okay oh, let me get let chicks me, let me yeah right yeah all the chicks you know right there she is just yeah. like her piece of breath gentlemen but uh um you know uh <laughs> He's yeah, like the, all the all the chicks who constitute a you know low single digit percentage of your viewing audience on social media, right? Who are fed information who don't actually know about gun stuff, you know? It, it's but yeah, that, that's the interesting thing though is that, you know that maybe shit in the cornflakes here a little bit. But, I mean, look at a guy like True Exodus, right? Like, I don't know, man. You know, there's a lot of people that follow him. There's a lot of people that, you know, I mean, that like his stuff. Maybe they're motivated. Maybe they're not. Um, you know, I think I think it is motivational, though. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, it motivated me. It's like, you know, I'm a production GM. I'm like a top 20 dude in USPSA. Or it used to be when I competed more, right? I mean, like, that's pretty impressive to me what he can do. Like, can I do that? Can I honestly really go out and do that? You know, even even with the best take that I'm going to take and, and toss on there, I, I don't know. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, something kind of kind of interesting to that. I, I think you know, for, for me, it was motivational. How, how did you get such ha fast hands, right? You know? Well, we also have people that are on YouTube and Instagram who are doctoring their, their footage. Sure. And we have some people that are, are viewed as very legit people that have some serious followings. And then we have some questionable people that have very big followings. And the minute, if, if we start analyzing their video and go, wait a minute, where did that mag go on that reload? That just kind of disappeared out of the frame or gravity doesn't move that fast. Yeah. 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 True, true that, you know, I, I, I mean, yeah, fa fast camera tricks. What's the line? It's the three amigos. There's the one dude, right? You know, it's Ned Niederlander, right? You know, and the, the other guy, right? The pilot, the German dude, right? You know, I practiced for days and days and I learned about your trick photography and then, you know, we'll, you know. Yeah. but uh, yeah, man, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's, uh, you know, sometimes it does push people to, to try harder. Can I do it? Can, can this work? And uh, it's like, you know, Answer is yes. I mean, you know, the question is also too. It's like how how fast do you really need to go? I think there are some folks out there who are on like very highly practiced courses of fire, who are out shooting their eyes. You know, if if you set up a steel challenge, oh, sorry, <laughs> like 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 if 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 you set up a course of fire for yourself in your backyard and you drill it over and over and over again until you're really proficient at it and you don't actually need to process any once once you've practiced it to the point where you no longer really need to process any information you can do it a lot faster than someone who's in a context where they actually need to process information we'll add right? that plus a million takes and you're only keeping the one good one right i mean Obviously, you shouldn't really be shooting faster than you can process information because then you're just pressing the trigger and the, inf the information in your environment is extremely relevant to the activity that you're doing, which is sh shooting people, right? Like, you, sh you shouldn't ever be not, you know, <laughs> processing the information of what's going on. Uh, I, I, su I suppose that you can get better at discerning what's relevant and using that, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That discrimination in order to look for specific information and get better at processing that faster, which helps you speed up your shooting. But I don't think you should be I don't think it gets you anything other than some sort of disp display of speed to position yourself to be shooting faster than you can process. Well, it turns into a parlor trick, right? You know, it's like instructor zero. Well, yeah, I mean, kind of. 
This the Italian. It turns into a safety. It turns into a safety consideration. What it turns into. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. there's only so many places in a in a draw presentation and trigger press that you can shave time off. Um, so if it gets to the point where the last thing you're trying to shave off is when you actually start pressing the trigger and you're trying to get that 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 point eight five that point nine zero. Um, there, there's only so many places you can trim time and you trim in the wrong spot and, um, you're going to have an oopsie. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it, that's, th those are the ones that end up on the, uh, on the editing floor. Um, your draw stroke specifically, if you're going to do it from concealment, the cover garments are one thing you can't control. You can control where the gun is every single time. You can control your grip. You can control all that other stuff, but it's, um, I spent several hours outside today, and by the time I got from, um, I was wearing a Velocity Systems polo, and I started off at, I, I don't know, it was probably 1 o'clock, somewhere in there. So it was warm here in Virginia. I got out there, and I started shooting. And within 45 minutes, that shirt was wet. It became harder to grip. I ended up with more and more cover garment malfunctions. My hand was slipping off. Um, it was acting completely different. And it doesn't matter how many times you dry fire. Um, if you don't incorporate the cover garment and then incorporate some sort of in, environmental factors, um, even if you don't have environmental factors, you're doing it in the garage, you're doing the basement, doing the bedroom, whatever. Um, very few shirts are manufactured the same unless you buy the same shirt the same day um, off the same rack. Um, you know, it's uh, I, I specifically tried a Velocity Systems Polo one because it was going to be hot as all get out out there, and I knew that I was going to be out on the range for a while. Um, but two just to the material because it does certain things very well as far as mitigating uh, the heat in my, my body temperature. And when I'm doing certain things, um, I wanted to try it because of its stretchy properties. And it's, it's a, uh, the texture of the shirt and being able to clear it is exponentially different than um, a regular polo shirt or a button down cover garment, or even a t-shirt. Um, it feels different. It acts different. Um, it acts different in environmental conditions, and it absolutely acts different when you incorporate sweat or some sort of of, uh, of water. So it's uh, you know if I if I want to get out there and start trying to shave time off um, sooner or later, you're going to end up shooting something you don't need to shoot or didn't mean to shoot. Um, it's just it, that is a, that's a simple mathematic problem. Yeah, I think that's a, another interesting point. Is you know I've met some guys who will advocate wearing the same type of shirt all the time you know and uh that, that may be good for them but for most people that's not realistic you know i mean we you know wear different clothes so we need to basically realize that and try it. and that's why I've, I've changed my draw stroke so that it works with almost everything i wear but um you know some days i may wear a suit you know other days i wear a polo uh you know something untucked um, you know, but it's, it's usually something different. So if, if guys aren't training for what they're wearing and they're, you know, they're gaming it per se on, uh, on their drive fire, then, you know, the day that they're not wearing that and they're wearing something different, it's, it's going to hurt them. Yep. It's, it's the same thing when you're out there and you're trying to videotape it and, and trying to figure out, uh, um, you know, how, how fast can you be guys, guys will, they'll cheat and they'll cup the bottom of the cover garment. They'll kind of dangle their fingers under it. So when the timer goes off, all they got to do is lift their hand up. There is no going down and actually fetching it with your non-firing hand and being able to clear the cover garment. So it's a, um, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I like to play games with it. And, and there's guys that don't like it. Um, I can teach a class and, and we'll be going down the line shooting one at a time. We'll be doing one shot presentations. Everybody will watch everybody else do it. And, and, watch the mistakes he makes, watch him double clutch on the cover garment, watch the cover garment malfunctions and he'll do something. And I'll, I'll grab his non-firing hand, throws him off a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll call his name. He'll look at me. When he looks at me, he moves his non-firing hand. Then I hit the timer. Um, and it's one of those things. Hey, stop trying to, like you're saying, Mike, stop trying to game it. <clears throat> you can set up everything. It's perfect. And you're going to be staying in the same spot. So when you hit the timer, your, your non-firing hand does one thing. It comes up to clear the cover garment move your hands around, bring your hands up in a carbine, bring your hands up in a um, submissive, you know, hey, give me your wallet, dude. Hold on a second. Whoa, 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 hold on. And, and then start moving your hands down to get to the point where the timer's going to go off. But it's a uh, gaming your your cover garment clearance. So that's, uh, you don't cheat yourself. That's uh, lying on the range is all it is. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that because today I was dry firing 
and uh, my elbow, I hit uh, uh, the stand where I, next to where I dry fire and it screwed my draw or my reload. And I, I stopped and I, I said, let's, I'm going to do that over again. And I realized, no, I'm going to kind of stand there where it's going to be every other time I might hit that so that I, even if it messes up, it may be slower, but at least I follow through and stay in the fight. And I, I just did it just to see where, how much of a difference it would make, you know, and it's funny because at first, you know, it totally screwed me up. But then as I went along with it, yeah, I was slower, but at least I was able to realize I could still fight through it. But it's any, anything that you do that's that's new. It's going it, to you're not familiar with. It's going to mess you up. So you should at least expose yourself to those different different types of things. Right. And then the, yep. the other thing is, if we want to talk about this in terms of concealment, if you're gaming your cover garment, you're telegraphing what you're going to do and then you're behind the curve in terms of the kind of counter ambush that you want to be deploying in self-defense right like if you're in a position where the use of your firearm is like second like a second from imminent how much do you really want to reveal the uh uh your 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 intention of I'm about to clear a cover garment, right? So the more you game it like that, the more you set yourself up to be behind the curve in a self defense situation. Sure. And the and the more consistently that you stage your practice, the more behind the curve you're going to be in a self defense situation because yeah. that's going to be. Cha chaotic and random and full of a number of variables that you're not going to be anticipating in 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 practice now now obviously you can't you can't account for every scenario and the more scenarios you want to account for the more practice you need to devote to it so at some point you spend your entire life practicing for for the you know de depending on what you do for a living or what your environment's like you over practice for the least likely thing that's ever going to occur so I think there's probably a point at which you have a reasonable amount of practice that broadly represents the kinds of skills that you're going to need to be able to deploy. And I think one of the things is to, you know, when I practice, I'll pick some of the most difficult garments that I have. I'll pick a shirt that is a little bit tighter or <clears throat> doesn't clear as well, or I'll use a, 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 a gun that's got a, a bigger grip and is a little more likely to snag on my cover garment. So the, the part of it that has the most detrimental variables and the most uh, built in randomization, like th this shirt isn't going to clear the same way every single time I'll practice in those to get the, the widest variety of, draws in the shortest amount of time right and, and guys don't guys don't practice and, and they do i see a lot of guys that'll even in a concealment class will will go from almost like a transition period where they where they where they're behind a carbine and they'll go to their handgun in a concealed mode there, there's some there's some roles that that's that's absolutely valid um but then there's other ones where it's you know practice from the submissive because it's um if it's a deadly force encounter and you're dressed like we are um, you know, day to day, it's, you know, somebody's got to go in there and, Hey, give me your wallet. Hey, give me your keys, um, whatever else. So practice in how, how do you, how do you talk your hands down a little bit? And when you're reaching for your wallet, do you actually, is you're reaching your support hand should be going for the front of your cover garment. If you've made that decision that, um, we're too close for missiles, I'm switching to guns. When you start to rotate, can, can you now rotate and, and clear your cover garment with your support hand? Yeah, and the other, the, I, I wish Varg was back now. One of the things that we talk about a lot is um, how overt is your draw going to be, right? The value of a concealed, uh, a concealed draw, either in the context, you know, if your hands on and grappling, how do you position your body in order to conceal your 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 gun because as soon as they see that you're 
sort of breaking one hand off to access a weapon, that immediately becomes the most important hand in the fight. And now you're in a struggle for the, for, for the weapon hand or the weapon. So there's the consideration of am, are, how, how, many, how much of my draw is necessarily going to be the hands up cover garment, you know, draw and how much of it is going to be negotiating the timing within the context of a, a, a close fight to access my gun. Or if it's not that, what we see a lot of, I mean, and I watch a lot of um, a great a great resource for for exploring the consistency with which this sort of thing happens is um, uh, the Active Self Protection Channel because he's got so many goddamn videos, um, and the number of draws that occur not in sort of like a blazing fast squared up quick draw competition, but the number of draws that occur in a sort of like there's a uh, armed robber or some sort of assailant assailant facing uh, a number of people and then the defender uses the distraction or the environment or the crowd to deploy a gun and gain the surprise that way so how much how much of that do you practice I and mean, if we look at what i mean especially in terms of like uh concealed carriers and, and civilians, the amount that people draw a gun while they've got like uh, hands on in a fight, you know, they're, they're fighting somebody off of them and then they get a gun out. And the number of people who deploy a gun where they've got like the timing and the environment on their side as part of how they're going to surprise their attacker is really high. So how much time should we really be spending on the hands up, clear the garment, go to the gun draw when those other two things seem to be as likely, if not more likely to happen for a concealed carrier. And then how, how the fuck do you even practice those things in your day to day? Well, I mean, a lot of that really is, is the base. I mean, you start with that, you know, with the hands up or its side, that's the base, you know, um, but the, the thing is you get really good at, at something like that and then you start incorporating the other things that you just mentioned there uh because you'll eventually still you know eventually go back to that position um uh, or maybe one hand uh, but i mean i think the one the really good valid point that you brought up was was concealment i mean if you're if you can you know get this hand down underneath your garment and hand on the grip you know you can just, you know you've, you've already move to covertly to that position there you're waiting for your opportunity and then you just you know you're going to have a sub second draw because your hand's already on the gun because you haven't moved fast or anything like that but um, there's a lot of those, those active self-protection videos are really really good too because you see a lot of people you know standing there and they're waiting waiting their turn per se and when they do and then it's a fast draw you know um but there are a lot of them too, where the guys are able to basically, while something is going on, you know, able to sneak their hand down there and get a good grip before that too. So um, it's a combination of things, but, you know, going to here fast, practicing that fast is really not going to hurt you going there covertly, you know? Right. So, um, but the other thing is, is, you know, scenario training, like, uh, you know, uh, Craig Douglas or ECQC, you know, I mean, when we were in the military, that was a great thing about having Sims and, you know, UTMs is, you know, we wanted to right in the team and we would fight and, and do stuff like that. And you could find out that, Hey, you know, that technique doesn't work or, you know, this did and stuff like that. So that, that was the benefit of doing that and trying different things. That's where we found out, you know, that the Serpa wasn't working for us because, you know, when we were fighting with simunitions and stuff, say, Hey man, you got a, you know, on your, on your uniform, you got a, a blue streak. Where'd that come from or whatever? Like, what are you talking about? And guys would, because they would do that double pump on the Serpa, you know, they would, bam, shoot themselves with a UTM or something like that and not know it, you know? And, you know. Well, but, they'd, they'd, you know, they'd, they'd know it if it was a fucking bullet. <laughs> right, exactly. But, you know, when you're, when you're fighting, you know, that's the thing is, and, and you may not initially, you know, I mean, if you're sitting there fighting, you know, um, you may not be aware that you were shot or something initially, you know, right. but because of the adrenaline and stress, but that's why, 
you know, we recommend the folks that, hey, if you get an opportunity to train with someone like Craig Douglas or somebody else that offers force on force and fighting and stuff like that, then take it, you know, because um, military and law enforcement, you know, I, I've heard some folks out there in the civilian concealed carry community poo-poo on military and law enforcement enforcement folks saying, well, you know, what What do they know about being a civilian concealed carrier? Well, you know, in their normal day-to-day activities and the fact that they worked in a tra- maybe a training facility where they were able to do force-on-force force daily, um, you know, they found out what worked and what didn't work. And if, you know, you may not feel comfortable training with someone like that, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But, you know, go out and train with someone who teaches force-on-force force and you'll see you know, that, um, you know, being a good marksmanship or good marksman able to get to the gun quickly and all that will pay off in, in the end, you know, but definitely get some type of force on force training and some combatives training out there. If you're going to conceal carry, that's, that's so important, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it should be part of it. If you're going to carry a gun, in my opinion, it's, it's, it should be almost mandatory to do some form of you know, combatives or something to that effect. And cause you just, and force on force training, you know, if, you know, in a perfect world, I would say, Hey, anybody wants a CCW, you got to take a ECQC with uh with South Narc or something like that, you know? Uh, but unfortunately we don't live in that world. So, you know, it's up to people to do it on their own. And, you know, you don't, you know, you may not be able to go train with him, you know, maybe go, I don't know, to some Krav Maga studio or something like that. But, you know, Anything is better than nothing, you know? Sadly, I need to end this episode. However, once I do that, you guys can keep on going. But I just need to do the the closing stuff. Right. So before right. I do that... Oh, what was that? No, I, I was going to say, I got to ditch anyway. I got to uh, uh, be up early in the morning, so... Yeah. Okay, so... Peeny, what do you have? Any clothing, closing thoughts or anything to plug? Uh, closing thoughts. This is the spinoff of Mike's thing with combatives, a uh, good physical fitness regiment, uh, as well should be something highly considered, uh, when carrying a firearm, because if your fat ass can't move, you can't fight, you can't think straight. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, uh, I always enjoy doing these. I appreciate uh, the chance to be on and yeah, um, rock on. Cool. John. Well, Thanks for having me. I'm glad that you uh, uh, in, invite me on to rant. Uh, I, I love to rant. I'll take any opportunity to, to do it. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, some of you guys I'm meeting for the first time. I, basically, every, everyone here except Matt I've, is, is my first time meeting with them. And it was a real pleasure. I'm really glad to. We've. I, I mean, for, uh, Matt and. Uh, Adam, I, I, I hadn't met uh, 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 Matt, Lesser Mike. or Mike, Mike and uh, Matt. And, or Varg, um, you've never met Varg. I met, I met Varg. Varg, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom of the screen trying to keep, keep it all straight. But uh, we've all sort of traveled in a number of the same circles, and I'm glad to finally meet you guys, and thanks for uh, hanging out with me. Anything cool to plug? Um, we have some pocket emergency wallets in stock. Uh, right. We had a, a little pre-run of them. The So Shop made a whole bunch of them. We were able to kit uh, a number of them up. They're almost all gone. But after this batch, we should have somewhere like 500 or 1,000 coming in. Um, and if you want to, if you're interested in uh, concealed carry equipment that involves a number of the considerations which we discussed tonight, you can visit filsterholsters.com and see what we have to offer. Cool. As I said in the beginning, uh, when I think of Filster, that's synonymous with uh, innovation. Thank you. And leading the pack, leading the charge. Um, Matt. Yes. Plug away. Anything cool that you want to promote? And, and final thoughts. I'm a terrible promoter. Victory-first.com, victory-wear.com. Um, barrels um i think uh i had everybody out there peeny's got a barrel or or two is waiting on 34 barrels um yep. that's pretty Pinch much him. it i don't what's that 
patiently um, waiting for that. I got a 19. I love it. And I'm waiting for that 34. They're coming. I, I, uh, I actually doubled down on the order. I went with, uh, I had it threaded and non-threaded on there. So that's what I had a double clutch on those. So I added some on, so we're going to get threaded and non-threaded when they come in. So, um, yeah, it's good to hang out. It's a, uh, it, it's a rarity that I get that, that I'm actually somewhere that I can, can I, that I can jump in, but, uh, it's always a good time to get on and, and uh, bounce some stuff around. So thanks for, uh, thanks for the invite. Oh yeah. And, and not that it's on the same subject, but just kind of a, kind of a cool little tidbit. What was your involvement with the SCAR? I was a senior program manager for assault weapons for FN. So, uh, did the new equipment training for SOCOM. Did, uh, uh, wrote the manual for the operator's manual and, and, Helped with the TM with Crane and all those guys. So it's, uh, I've got some, uh, yeah. Let's see if I get the, my, my memorial pictures up there. Some of the, uh, some of the stuff we did. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a page in my history that, uh, will, will forever be. I might as well just go get a tattoo because it's one of those things that's, that, that, uh, always comes up. Yeah. Oh, I saw the, I saw the pictures in the scar and I thought, oh, wait a minute. We didn't address that. That's yep. that's cool history. Those are uh, most people don't even when they see them now they're like, oh, those those aren't scars. Uh, yeah, actually, that's uh, those are the first two babies. Um, and it's well, just like I think it was on. I don't remember where it was. I put up the picture of the first the the SSR, which is the first Mark Twenty before was a Mark Twenty before. So Com said that they wanted it, and, and people ran and raved that it was airsoft. It was actually the first the first SSR that we ever built. So it, it is. Cool. Oh. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm breaking stuff now. Cool. Yeah. And I last year uh, a bunch of us got to hang out at FN, an awesome group of people. Yes. There used to there used to be some cooler dudes that worked there and then they left and went to work for the government. So <laughs> no, that's the uh and that's the that's where uh, that's where a lot of it came from. The Joint Combat Pistol Program for the Air Force. That's when we that were the first production red dot handgun was the uh, it ended up being the FNP forty five tactical. But that was where we uh, that's where we started the red red dots on handguns in oh oh four oh five I guess when we started that. So that's that's where I cut my teeth on red dots on guns too. So a lot a lot of history with FN. That is cool, Mike. Yep. Final thoughts, plugging. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm real, real excited to be here. Uh, it was great to meet the guys that I didn't meet uh, or didn't know or, or work, you know, before. Uh, I think uh, uh, John was the only one, I think, uh, tonight that I hadn't been on with before. I'm really impressed with your uh, with your site and your gear. There. Thank you. I really appreciate really that. Really nice. Um, but, you know, um, I actually have a, uh, in October 6th and 7th, uh, my advanced covert carry skills is coming up. I'm running that in uh, somewhere up here in Northern Virginia or maybe even West Virginia. I don't have okay. a location, but, you know, we're going to talk a lot about and validate a lot of the stuff that we've talked about tonight um, over those two days. Um, I look forward to that, but our, uh, our other classes are filling up. Um, you know, um, most of our stuff is in the Northern Virginia area. So, um, got a couple classes in Raymond, Mississippi, um, I'll be down in Louisiana training some folks too, but, uh, it's green dash ops.com. That's our website. Um, really, uh, look forward to, uh, shooting more too. Cause uh, I've been training so much and traveling so much. I just, uh, I really haven't had that time to, uh, train, you know, work on my skills, uh, which always sucks. You know, when you're, you're training folks, you know, you just don't, you know, put the time in for yourself and um, I've started dry firing a little bit more uh, but I've been to places where I'm not able to carry a gun it was seven countries in six months and uh, you know I took this month off so I could focus on getting some training for myself and uh, looking forward to, uh, to something else that I can hopefully contribute to cool good stuff well thanks Thanks to the panel for, for joining us. Um, thanks to the viewers for watching or listening, depending on the format you're using. Also, another thank you to Facts on Firearms, our, uh, the sponsor for the, for, uh, the podcast. 
Faxonfirearms.com if you're looking for pistol barrels, AR-15 barrels, AR-15 parts, um, pistol caliber carbine parts. They have them. Uh, also, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Patreon subscribers, without your support, this would not be as consistent. This might not even exist because this, yeah, this is, uh, it, it does take some effort. Uh, matter of fact, uh, with everything that's going on in primary and secondary, it takes up a lot of time and a lot of resources. So your, your support definitely helps us uh, maintain this moving, especially now that I'm working full time again. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. We do have a website. If you go to primaryandsecondary.com, you can find all kinds of resources. I have, let's see here, all the Facebook groups listed on that on the website. Uh, we have a training calendar that's also free to use. So if there's training you want to add to it, let me know. Um, I, I do need to ask some questions because we're not just letting everyone add to it. We do need to do a little bit of screening. Uh, but if these are, are if these are, are are friends of primary and secondary people that have been on the podcast, people that we're familiar with, most likely we'll we'll let you have access to to add those those courses. And hopefully this will also help you fill up your classes that you need filling. Because as a host, I personally know that's kind of difficult. And to be able to offer this type of a resource to me is just invaluable. And so I love to be able to provide that um, to to people that are hosting classes. Um, this will be on iTunes, Vimeo, iHeartRadio, all the, the major places. Next week, I'm going to try to do a cop-centric uh, episode. It may not be at our normal time. I'm working on that. But as per the norm, yeah, I, I don't know. So, yeah, big big thanks to, to everyone. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share. Um, I suspect, especially with this episode, there may be a little bit more sharing. Feel free to subscribe. To, to share because there's some really good really good discussion going on in these I, I find them to be helpful I like them I like sharing them so that's all I will talk to you guys next week <laughs> <laughs>